G'day guys, welcome to the Noob Spiro Podcast. It's Shrek here. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome aboard the Noob Spiro Podcast. It's the show where we interview spearfishing experts from all over the world. Today is we're, we're headed to Melbourne, back to Melbourne to chat to another club spearfish member. His name is Eckhart Birkenstein, and uh, we dive deep into crayfish hunting now lobsters in some parts of the world crayfish and others we talk about where they like to hide how you can find them how you can get hold of them and secure your own um, we, we, we we chat for a good 15 minutes about how to catch crayfish in this episode's veterans vault and um, Eckhart is an absolute character this is probably the longest interview we've ever done but uh, it's for good reason he's got a ton of knowledge he's originally from South Africa and he's taught spearfishing and freediving uh, both there and here in Australia and uh, he's a he's a he's a he's a wealth of knowledge so this interview is very good now before we get there a couple of bits and pieces of news uh, two local lads in Brisbane um, were recently winched to safety off the New South Wales coast and uh, is actually a former guest on the New Spiro podcast um, his name's Trevor and him and Dylan got caught out off the uh, Nine Mile Reef off Tweeds and I haven't heard the full story from Trevor yet so I don't, I'm not going to share too many details but um, basically they got separated from their from their boat and started making a swim back to land um, the skipper of the boat did the right thing called Triple O uh, the emergency number and um, thankfully, like the marine services just uh, mobilised so quickly. I believe they had uh, three helicopters and, or it might have been two helicopters and five boats going looking for them. And uh, they found the boys uh, having after having swum a little while, and uh, and they were both okay, uh, taken to hospital to sort of check them out. But everything come back good, so I'm glad they're all good. Um, I'm hoping Turbo can catch up with maybe Trevor this week and find out a little bit more about the story about what happened. Um, and other news: Gr Tar, Jason Wetmore, and Richie Zacker won the Florida State Team Spearfishing Championship. And uh, that means they qualify for the internationals. So we've got to get some of these blokes on the podcast at some stage in the uh, future. Uh, I've listened to GR Tar chat before in the past, and uh, he's an absolute character. So good on those guys. Check out that news if you want to learn a bit more about that over at deeperblue.com. Uh, also, Scuba Diver Magazine um, have got a new spearfishing section. And uh, I've actually submitted a story. So we got a two-page spread, I believe, uh, coming out in the next edition. It's a story I penned for them, so Scuba Diver Magazine, check that out. Um, also, what else is happening? We had a couple of brilliant iTunes reviews, so I want to tell you about them. Um, Tommy Doz, he says, Great podcast, my diving hunting has improved in leaps and bounds, and it's genuinely interesting to listen to. I think he's talking about the podcast. With a few laughs added in. Keep it up, legends. Cheers, Tom. So thanks for that, Tom. That was the latest iTunes reviews. Before that, we had Dragon Lord. He said, awesome podcast. Great work, guys. Has helped me out lots. Um, at the beginning of listening, I had only shot a flathead. Now I feel much more confident with my gear and diving. Keep it up. Awesome work. So that's a really cool review. We also got an Irish review, which uh, we haven't had yet. So the first one, Stephen Quigley the first writes, Thoroughly enjoyed the show. Keep up the good work. And Brandon Hendrickson, former guest, he wrote a, a bit of a quick review up there as well. He said a great reverse, uh, resource for Spiros, new and old to the sport. So quick catch up on iTunes reviews today. But wherever you listen to the show, if you if you like it, just pump up a review. It helps other people find the show and would appreciate that a ton. Right, let's get into today's interview with Eckhart Birkenstein. Down in Melbourne, catching crayfish. Here we go. Spear guns, they're only as good as their rubber and rigging. Do yourself a favour, check your gear regularly so that you don't end up like my good mate Shrek does constantly, having rubbers break, bridles pull out, and uh, spear shafts going off into the distance. Head into spearfishing.com.au. Do yourself a favour, update some of that gear that's starting to perish. Use the code NoobSpear at checkout and you'll save $20 on all purchases over $200. Big thanks to our show sponsor, Adreno. G'day, guys. Welcome to today's NoobSpear podcast. We've just um, had a little bit of a quick chat with Turbo. There's been a severe workplace injury over there at NoobSpear HQ. Turbo, can you fill Eckhart and the listeners in on, on what's happened to you, buddy? Yeah, so I was having a little... Um, little pre-interview wine and then I um, shut the 
what are you, the waiter's friend, a little bit that cuts the foil off on my finger and it hasn't stopped bleeding. So I couldn't find <laughs> any Band-Aids in the house, so it's toilet paper and sticky tape. But now yeah. I can't use the trackpad on the Mac and it's, it's actually quite difficult. It's um, unbelievably difficult. So right. thanks, buddy. So there's, That was good. So there's one. There's wine flowing freely. Eckhart, is, uh, he lives in Melbourne, works at Adreno. He's a spearfishing and freediving instructor, originally from South Africa. It's great to have you with us. Eckhart, you're also having a vino, I believe. Of course, of course. It's uh, from Spain, a little tempranilla, just to uh, get the evening going, you know. Oh, mate, that's, right. that's really nice. Mine's that's from a box that says Banrock Station. I don't even know why I was using the waiter's friend, to be honest. <laughs> Uh, so the interview is kicking off with a bang. Um, what do you do at Adreno um, down there? Our major show sponsor. You, you, you. What's your role there? Uh, I feel like I'm part of the woodwork, mate. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty much there uh, five days a week and um, help help the team at Adreno with with just sales and um, I'm the assistant store manager there. So keeps me pretty busy. <clears throat> So you're a, assistant, you're a, assistant store manager, or assistant to the store manager? Well, I guess they both would be this very similar to the same thing. Yeah, same, same, I, but different. I mess, <laughs> I, I message your your boss, and they said you just do a bit of cleaning. Oh well, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's good to have you with us, Eckhart. I've, I've chatted with you briefly before. Just um, so, are you also part of Club Spearfish? Because we've recently had Sven on the show. And I, I just, it seems like all you blokes are in the same club down there. Yeah, so I am actually, but you look, um, the last time I was at a meeting was like over a year ago with uh, a new family. You've, your spare time is severely limited. So I actually haven't even been to a meeting in, I'd say, at least a year. But I, I'm, I'm still <laughs> technically... Uh, uh, a silent member of the club. Okay, all right. It sounds like there's a pretty good culture down there. Um, how long have you been spearfishing for and, and, and where did you get started with it all? So I started spearfishing, I guess it's a bit of a longer story. I, I grew up in Namibia, which is just, just north of South Africa on the west coast. Okay. And my father would always take us as a family down to the beach and go dive crayfish with a whole bunch of other families. So being near the ocean and, and going fishing on the weekends with them was always kind of part of life. And I think it's, I mean, if, if you chat to a lot of people, everyone's got very, a lot of people actually have similar stories where, you know, the ocean was always part of their kind of upbringing and, and the, the story of how they grew up. So the ocean was definitely the same for me, like super important in terms of like we used to go fishing with my my father on the weekends and um, he'd go crayfish diving. So that was part of the story. And we moved to South Africa when I was uh, like 13, 12, 13. And the fishing was, uh, you know, the shore angling in, in South Africa. I mean, you've got to know what you're doing, which being young, I, I had no idea. So it was a little bit boring for me. So I started surfing. So I spent my high school in the water just surfing. And when I moved to uh, Cape Town, where you can actually um, start crayfish diving, because where I grew up in this little coastal town, this small little town called George, uh, which is a great neck of the woods. Actually, if, if you guys have ever heard about the the white mussel cracker, it's a mm. kind of a very well-known South African fish species. It's, it's one of the meccas uh, for them. But mm. there isn't really much crayfish life there. I, although I have found crayfish there, um, it's it's v- incredibly rare. Um, so when I moved to Cape Town, me and my brother actually started crayfish diving. You know, you're diving down, grabbing a couple of crays, and all of a sudden you you know you see some fish. And you know, obviously the 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 the, the, the brain started to work, and we started to mm. kind of put two and three together, and get five. Uh, <laughs> what had happened actually was my brother. Over that, like this December holiday, because South Africa's got, like most places in the world, world has got seasons for your crayfish or lobster. Um, the, the main season is kind of over that kind of December, November, December, January period. And he'd gone to a very remote coastline of South Africa. Uh, the It's called the Trans Sky. Mm-hmm. And he had like borrowed some old gear and taken my dad's old like Obelay champion, you know, the old gray. Um, handled like champion guns. No, I've heard of them. I don't know. I don't know them, but I've heard of them. 
Okay. By the time we were using it, I think the thing was like 40 years old. Like it was ancient. So he shot a muscle cracker and the whole thing just basically fell apart on the first fish. But, oh. you know, he came back with, you know, eyes wide open and he was like, oh my gosh, we got to get, you know, we got to do this thing and, and get on it. And uh, then me and him uh, went to the Trans Sky on a trip and we did the same thing. We borrowed some old gear. We tried to fix up this old gun, uh, which worked but you know we quickly realized this is probably not the best way to to guarantee landing any fish and we went up there and uh we'd share the gun between the two of us uh, so it was really um cool that first trip because we you know he had the gun first and uh, i can't remember exactly what fish he shot but i remember i got an opportunity and, and, and there's a fish in south africa called the the natal knife jaw um, okay. It's like a kind of similar to a, uh, like a like a parrotfish. It's got quite a beak on it, um, uh, but they are literally the, the world's friendliest fish. So <laughs> perfect to start out on. So the fish <laughs> swam up to me, and I had the gun at the time. And I remember like I swam kind of to mid water, and this fish swam up to me. And I looked at my brother, and he was like, you know, giving me the thumbs up. And I'm like, oh man, this doesn't quite feel right so i kind of waited for the fish to kind of turn away and start swimming away so it's in my head i was like okay you know little little bit of a fighting chance to get away and managed to get him and we had that for dinner uh but we didn't you know have much luck because we were just kind of getting in, into the water and came back to cape town um still kind of in, over that december january period and that's when um the certain coastline uh maybe about three hours up from Cape Town, it's called Stray Spy. Uh, it, the, the, they've got an incredible run of uh, kingfish or yellowtail. I got invited on a boat and, you know, used an old surf wetsuit. And the guy gave me like a 1.2 uh, rugby tech gun, I think it was at the time. Yeah. And um, anyway, so all this borrowed gear and went out. And I was just, I don't know, man, beginner's luck or what. But I shot uh two yellowtail on that on that uh, first trip out and it's, it's almost like those i mean i shot the knife jaw and then i shot the two yellowtail so it's kind of a big jump from like little mm. reef fish to all of a sudden shooting something that can like that's literally pulling you underwater yeah, yeah. and um, i remember getting home and i was like that's it i i basically just went and i just bought everything i was like this is this is me for life i'm i'm set i'm done <laughs> so Basically wow. set set myself up and um, kind of started. Oh, geez, it would be like 15 years ago. Okay, so you got started about 15 years ago, like sort of more seriously there in South Africa. When did you make the move to Australia? My wife and I came over uh, four years ago, actually. Moved to Melbourne. Just by the by is probably you know the at the bottom of a long list of places you'd want to get to in Australia if spearfishing was yeah kind of. Same passion. It's the wrong end of the country, really, isn't it? Well, uh, yes and no, man. Like each pl place has got you know unique things to yeah. to uh, th that it has, and uh, it's taken me a while to get to know what those things are here. Um, but you know, we've got like an amazing run of uh, calamari, um, and they get they they get massive, and it's heaps of fun shooting them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's there's lots of challenges to be had here. And I mean, we do get kingfish, but I mean, uh, you know, most of the diving here is shore based. Like I've only done, I think maybe five sh boat dives since I've moved here. So everything is shore based. Um, but pretty much everything that you can shoot from a boat, bar like a bluefin tuna, um, you can shoot from a shore dive. Okay. So there's actually a <clears throat> lot accessible to you as a sh as, as a shore diver. Um, so. Literally, I'd say, you know, 95% of all divers around here, that everybody does shore dives. Not everyone can be like Turbo, you know. He's got a couple of boats. That's not true. Turbo? That's, that's actually I, not true. Oh, you've only got one now. Oh, no, yeah, 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 no you are right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, no, he's right. He's he's right. I've got a couple of projects on the go. None, none of my boats <laughs> actually go, and he likes to remind me of it. <laughs> oh, projects, projects is one word for an Um It's you a, know, a other, light term for the. Uh, wow, you know, I can't say too much because there's boxes of my stuff sitting in one of them, so I'm just going to leave it like that. They're, it's a nice that, story. One's a storage, storage boat. When uh, Shrek was in China, his mate said, um, "Shrek's got a couple of 
boxes at my place. That will actually, Shrek said, I've got a couple of boxes. My mate's bringing them around. Can you keep them at your house? And I said, no worries. It was one of those classic things. When old mate showed up with his trailer and his ute and these couple of boxes turned into Just like... A couple. Yeah, like pretty much a couple of ton of crap. So now it's all under my house. Um, it's yeah. it's it's actually been really. Yeah, uh... been great for kindling. Hey, <laughs> it's good for our <laughs> it's good for our friendship, Eckhart. Have you heard of Storage King in Australia? Uh, yeah, <laughs> Turbo is the Storage Queen. So we're all over it. We're just Man. expanding our reach. All let's right, talk so spear get, fishing. Get, yeah, let's talk spear fishing. Um, okay, so ninety five percent of the diving down there is 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 like as you say, shore base. What what kind of um, challenges does that sort of lend to? Well, geez, there's actually heaps to be honest. I guess the one is the equipment side of things. So do, doing rock hopping, you're incredibly rough on your gear. Like so, your mm-hmm. socks. Um, I mean, you kind of fly through socks like quite a lot because I mean, sometimes you're doing fairly long walks. Uh, you know, you, you could do the um, uh, the alternative thing of getting a pair of Crocs and walking around in them, but you know, most guys just wear wear their wetsuit socks and you know destroy them and get some new ones. So gear wise, it's definitely um, uh, it's hard in the gear. Um, yeah. So that's that's definitely a challenge, and also. The weather-wise in in Melbourne, it's it's been a real learning curve because one, you know, the back beaches, uh, they're very temperamental in terms of swell. And if there's any kind of increase in swell, the the, the currents that are running off the shore can get incredibly strong. Okay. So there's there's th- that aspect. Uh, there's not, so there's a just kind of like the the currents that are running off the shore, but then you also get tidal currents because Melbourne has got two main bays. So you've got Port Phillip Bay. And then you've got Western Port, and the water obviously high and low. It's 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 coming in and out of there all the time. So there's that tidal movement too. So there's actually a lot of water movement, which is it's pros and cons because, um, you know the the pro to that is you know if we get heaps of rain, obviously the the bay can get very filthy, but it brings down nutrient rich water. Mm. And then obviously you know a couple of tidal changes in you know either a more rain or or like crazy winds. That that dirty water gets uh, gets to moved out of the bay actually really quick. So, uh, so that's when mm. I when I when I came here, I you know obviously try to ask as many questions as I could, but I basically just pack my car and drive as far north as possible, and then just see what the water's like and keep driving south until you know it starts getting better. And as soon as I go, okay, yeah, you know this this looks like we can get in the water here. Um, you know, I'd start kind of trying to look for reef or look on Google Maps and and see where I can find structural reef and and just basically get in and explore and see what it's like. Yeah. So so the further south you go in the bay, generally the rule of thumb is that the visi- the visibility in the bay gets better. Right. And oh, cool. What's the trade off there? Um, like obviously, like you said, obviously the further south you go, the better that vis gets. Now, is the diving better in the north because of that reason? Because there's less pressure due to dirtier water. Is is that something that you find? Yes, and it depends on this, or what kind of species you're hunting. Okay. But the further north you go, like this, there, there isn't a lot of great structure. Okay. Um, now, obviously, if you had a boat, that would change dynamics completely. But most of what we have accessible on shore dives, the, the structure isn't that amazing. Uh, the further north you go in the bay, but the, the, I mean, there's definitely reefs and stuff that you can explore. But kind of in that middle. Frankston, Mount Martha, Mornington areas. It's kind of like the like I'd say like eighty percent of of spiros in in Melbourne cut their teeth. Is is kind of in that neck of the woods. Okay. So so Eka, you've been you've been spearfishing fifteen years, and uh, I mean I wanted to take it back to a bit of a personal level. What what sort of gave you the motivation to become a freediving instructor? When did you do your first course, and sort of you know what inspired that? <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the kind of Reader's Digest version. So when I started spearfishing, um, obviously being such a long time ago, there wasn't really a lot of information that's accessible. Like So these days, you know, you can watch YouTube videos uh, of some of the best like freedivers in the world and, and get tips and technique tips. And there's obviously, uh, you know, f- generally freediving courses pretty much in every major s- you know, city in in Australia, um, you know, it's, it's 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 pretty easily accessible, and that information is is so powerful. So I realised that there was a need after making heaps of mistakes, basically. So when I started spearfishing, so like, I'll, I'll give you one one quick story. When I started spearfishing, you know, no one really taught us, uh, you know, safe equalisation and what, when, and how to equalise. And um, 
you know, I, I used to go spear fishing, and every now and then I'd have one of my ears just just stop equalizing at let's say you know five to six meters, and I just it got me so frustrated, and I'd swim down, and I just couldn't get beyond this point. But my one ear would equalize, and the other ear wouldn't, and um, I just thought, well, you know, clearly I'm not blowing hard enough, so I just thought, you know, as as any young guy would, you know, add add a bit of force and a bit of elbow power, and see how you go. And, um, you know, it, it worked for a while. And then one day I did that and I actually blew my eardrum uh, or ruptured my eardrum. And I just remember this like rush of water and just this absolute weird sensation. Um, that didn't stop me from diving though. I just kind of carried on diving for the day. And I remember getting out and getting to my car and I just like, didn't feel like so dizzy, but I was just like, I just couldn't hear properly. Like I didn't know what was going on. Uh And, um, yeah, I ended up losing about 10, maybe even up to 15% of my hearing in that year. Um, and so, and, uh, what what do you call that? Like ringing in your ear? Like, yeah. So this stuff came around and I was like, this sucks. And then my dad's a doctor and he was like, look, you've actually got this for life. And that kind of (laughs) brought it down to me. I was like, this this is horrific. (laughs) So I was like, I don't want to make more mistakes like this. So I got in contact with Trevor Hutton, which is at the time he was basically South Africa's best free diver. He's an incredible spear. I mean, he dives super deep, um, like stupid depths. And so I did a course with him and that just really, uh, you know, put a lot of uh, things in place. Like I was diving, like I didn't realize I was diving dangerously, but I was doing like, I wasn't doing long dives, but I was doing hardly any surface interval. But then again, you know, like I didn't know, I didn't have that information. So I would dive for like 20, 30 seconds and I'd be on the surface for 20, 30 seconds. Ah, And I would, and I would do that for like two, three hours. And after doing this course, I was like, right, this is why I've got migraines. And, you know, like uh, after pretty much every dive, you know, it was, it was brought home a lot of stuff to me. Yeah, right. So I did that course with him and it kind of started that kind of like that learning process, just realizing uh, what a lack of knowledge I had and how much I had to learn and try to unlearn bad habits, really. And then actually, I'd always looked into becoming an instructor, but, oh, you know, it just never really came around uh, or an opportunity didn't present itself. And then um, I got in contact with Adam Stern. I don't know if you yeah. guys might have yeah, heard yeah. about it. Yeah, we know him. Yep. So, yeah, amazing guy. I did one of his deep weeks last year um, wow. and then just did, did my in, in uh, instructors with him too and that was again like to actually go and free dive for a week it's just it's it's like uh it's such an intensive time and you're like you're just diving every single day you know this theory it's like it's you know there's like 40 50 people I, I don't know how many i think this this year i saw that he had a massive group but there's so many divers so you, you're watching everybody dive you're learning so much and um yeah it was, it was pretty pretty crazy so um, and that was like a, just a process to, you know, uh, start this edu- like learning thing and try to learn more and, uh, you know, get better habits. Um, I was teaching, you know, beginner spearfishing courses in South Africa, but, uh, you know, coming to Australia, you also realize like you can't just like <laughs> with insurance and liability, you can't just go ahead and, uh, you know, just do something on your own. You've got to uh, mm-hmm. figure out the right way to do things. So, um, yeah. yeah, I did my yeah, so I did my instructors with 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 Adam. Yeah, been teaching since last year. And you're pretty well regarded by some of those Melbourne guys. I've heard of a couple of good things about you, so that's pretty awesome. I wanted to I wanted to get a bit of background on it. How, how, how do you go finding um, depth in Melbourne? Like, where would you do your courses? If you know, if you're taking well, that's a thing. Melbourne's actually it's really hard to get depth because you've got to put it like this: diving the back beaches, you're only going to get maybe seven days in a month if you're lucky that you can dive the back beaches that is calm enough Hmm. but then you know most of those days fall during the week obviously Obviously. Uh, so so you've pretty much just got the bay to dive Um, and the bay is incredibly shallow you know for you to find depth in the bay is pretty hard and then you you swim out in the bay and then there's all the boats so you know i have a few friends that have actually had very very close i personally I've, i've had a few pretty close calls with boats but you know in summer i almost avoid diving the bay because there there's so much boat traffic i for the courses i actually um 
charter a boat and and then uh, we've got that boat right there as a safety so if another boat approaches they can actually put their boat in between us as divers mm -hmm. uh, so they can kind of block even though we've got a flag, there's a diver's flag up, you, you just need somebody that's on the boat that's skippering that can maneuver the boat in such a way that, that you're theoretically protected and, you know, pick you up at the end of a drift and then move you back up um, and then you well, can just do another drift. This is a really good point. We haven't actually discussed this much on the on the show, but, like, walk, like walk us through what a good boatie does when they're sort of the wingman on the boat looking after everyone in the water. Yeah. So, look, I've learned a lot. Uh, I used to own a boat and I'm, I'm pretty sad that i had to sell it to move here but you know i'll help help pay for some tickets um but there's a lot of things that that a body can do so here in melbourne and i'm not sure how you guys dive further north but in melbourne a lot of the guys anchor up um yep. and then everybody gets out of the boat and everybody kind of like swims off and goes spearfishing okay. where in south africa you would i mean i guess because of the shark um thing you, you just you'd never anchor up there's always somebody is in the boat watching the divers at all times yeah yeah. Um, that's kind of been ingrained in me as a, as a body. You have to be observant of, of where your divers are and their body language. Sometimes, like, you, you can easily see a, a diver that's fighting a fish. Um, you know, one, you'll see the gun floating right next to him, and he'll either be uh, pulling up the line from the reel, or you'll see the float start moving around and then fighting on the float line. So you start observing those kind of things in, in, in the divers that are in the water uh, and then obviously you know that you need to get closer so there's opportunity sometimes in south africa when we hunt kingfish it's like a it's an, it's a it's a team sport um so if you swim into a school of, of kingfish you call the boat over as quickly as you can and so uh, as a boaty you've got to be like on your a game um, and you kind of uh, head straight in there you you give the guy a, a, a second gun. You take his gun and clip it off on the side of the boat. He's got that gun then to uh, reload and then hopefully shoot a second fish out of the school. And then, I mean, you're passing guns to, like, the other divers too because, you know, you're, you're generally – when you shoot one, you'll hold that fish in, you know, seven to eight meters of water. Your buddy can shoot a fish. Then hopefully you get another gun and hopefully you get another fish like, shot in a fish. And obviously it's like a massive, like, spaghetti meatball mess. Yeah. But then <laughs> – you know, you spend like 15 minutes sorting that out and then uh, bite the yeah. fish and then start the prices all over. So there's that element where you're watching the divers in the water and their safety. I could tell you another. Okay, so let, let me tell you a little quick little story. So I, I went diving with a friend of mine and this guy is like, I don't know, man, he's got a magnet for great whites. It's ridiculous. So again, we're talking about body language and watching your the guys in the water. So we jump in this place and this place is like pretty – notorious for great whites and i swim down and it's not deep but seven to eight meters of water i swim down and i'm sitting there and it's like it's green like we call it great white green you like you get there and i'm just like i can barely see the end of my gun this i was just like in, in my head i'm just like this is all levels of wrong we've got to get out of here right now this is not good so i swim up and i'm just about to grab my mate's arm just say, hey like look let's let's maybe let's let's get out of here this i'm not having a good feeling and he swims down so i'm like okay look, i've got to wait and wait for him to come up so i'm busy waiting but i mean obviously like you know you can i can't see anything and uh, all of a sudden he shoots up next to me uh, and he's kick he's finning so hard that he fins his whole half a body out of the water and all he shots is white 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 puts his head back in the water we we go like back to back um looking for this shark that he'd seen um but literally in like maybe five ten seconds the boat was like right on us we we jumped so hard like i think we almost flew over the other side of the boat and the viz ended up being so bad that the the, the great white had swam underneath me and i hadn't seen a thing and oh, yeah. it nearly swam straight over his head oh. so it was I've yeah a, so i've seen a video like that getting around on facebook and it's in that green South African water and this aggressive white point is sort of coming up on the divers. And the guy gets to the surface and he yells out, what, what, what? <laughs> and, that, and, that, and that great South African accent that you guys have got. That was perfect. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, so like, as you were telling me the story, I was getting the visuals and everything. Like, so, yeah, and so that's a good, a good, um, a good, it's a good story to sort of demonstrate, you know, what a good boaty is. It's it's someone that's aware. 
So that's it. So you're, you're being aware of your divers, of where they are and when they're diving. So you actually, you'll know that, you know, this person, he's a minute and a half diver. This person is a 40 second diver. So you'll see, when, and, and so you'll have a rough idea of when they're going to come up. So, you know, there's that aspect where if, if one of your divers dives, like you can't just go and fetch something from another diver because you, you're not hundred percent sure where this other guy's going to come up. You've got to wait for that person to come up so that you can then maneuver the boat. If that makes sense. Yep. Um, and then the other thing is, obviously, um, as a boatie, you're, you're, one of the biggest concerns is other boats because a lot of times uh, the other boats, they'll see the boat, but they, 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 they struggle to see whether it's uh, you know, sunlight and glare or swell or surface yeah. chop. They struggle to see the divers or their floats and flags. So you've got to be aware that you might have to reposition the boat in between uh, an oncoming boat and the divers so that you're protecting your divers in that sense. Yeah, it's surprising how many um, guys on the water that don't understand what a dive flag is and what it means. Oh, it's incredible. Well, look, here, so here in Melbourne, again, it's summer is absolutely, there's like a crazy amount of jet skiers mm. and boaties. And what I find is they'll literally, uh, so I think it's 50 meters. You're not, you've got to be five knots and under. Yeah. If, if there's a dive flag, but these guys will at full pace, like will cruise right up to your float because they want to know what it is. Yeah. And you know, like sometimes they'll go over your float line, chew up your float line in their prop. Like it's, it's pretty dangerous. So you've got to have like a big, big float with a, and even with a big float, like, so normally what I do if I'm diving in the bay is if, if I even hear a boat, I'll, I'll pop my head above water and kind of figure out where that, where that boat is and uh, where they're coming from and if i see that they're going to be in the vicinity of where i am I'll, I'll actually raise my gun out of the water and wave it so that i can try and get their attention just so that they know that there's somebody in the water yeah, yeah the, the other the other problem with that too is you get the doppler effect so if you've got a boat coming dead on you don't even hear the bloody thing because of the way the the hull sort of sends the sound waves so like it's a friggin' hopeless scenario and like so what you're saying with a good boaty positioning them themselves between oncoming boats and the divers is just friggin uh, uh, that's one of the best things about having a boaty i reckon with a big with a big with a big dive flag on the top and a bad attitude behind the wheel <laughs> I, I just love a boaty okay boat. you can guarantee that that term the doppler effect and what trek just told you came from this one book that he bought about boating from an op shop. I saw it in his toilet, splattered in urine, this thing being there for 100 years. And uh, it was... He's learned one new word. He's learned that one yeah. fact from it. Uh, so I it was, got it. It was worth the $2.50. No, no, it was a dollar right fifty. Right now it's underneath my house in a box because he won't get rid of it. You can guarantee I it. I will not get rid of that book. That book was gold, <laughs> solid gold. I learned what a displacement hull was. That's 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 a huge thing. Uh, <laughs> it's full of gold splashes or just gold? <laughs> no, it's covered in gold splashes and inside it's full of gold advice. No, th mm. those, are, those, are, those old books are the best and, and they've given me everything I know, I swear it. But um, no, no, good boaties worth their weight in gold, that's for sure. Um, one thing... Another thing like new, what, what's some mistakes, some common mistakes in new boaties make, Eckhart? Kind of in my mind, uh, some of the things that, that a lot of people do, and again, it's, it's different people's perspective. Like, so when I had a boat, I wanted my trailer to be in the water for as little as possible because any time, you know, if you're driving, your, your hubs get quite warm and you put warm hubs in cold water, it'll contract and it'll actually suck water into the bearing. Uh, and that's why, uh, you know, your bearings um, on your trailer, um, it's, there's a, I mean, I'm sure you guys would have experienced it where, you know, the bearings will seize and you'll be cruising down the, the road and all of a sudden you see a tire, <laughs> your trailer tire going past the car, you know, so those things, those things happen. So uh, one is obviously trying to, trying to make sure that, you know, your bearings are cool when you're launching your boat um, and, and then trying to make sure that you're, you basically um, knock the, the, the boat off into the water and then pull the 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 trailer straight out so the, the, the trailer is only in the water for like maybe you know 10 15 seconds you're basically reversing it and stamping on the brakes and that gives it that like momentum and it knocks and it can just roll straight off and then you can drive straight out and the guys can hold the the boat in position uh, and the body can be in the water starting the motor straight away if, if you have to deal with surge and things like that so 
I see a lot of people here, you know, they might spend 15 minutes with the trailer in the water uh, while they're busy doing all this stuff. And my, my, my head is just like the bearings, the bearings. No, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Exploding. Or I, was, I was thinking more like on water stuff, but that's a great practical one as well that I honestly wasn't actually aware of. So I've learned something. Trick, but like what, in terms of. Trick, what does it say in, in your book, mate, about um, bearings? Is he right? <laughs> Uh, that look, back in those days, circa 1952, <laughs> bearing trailers were, you know, were quite a rarity. So I actually, I've got to get an updated version about bearings. Um, well, the the other the other uh, trick that uh, me and uh, a bunch of my friends had was we'd actually have a spare hub with bearings, everything attached, so that if anything seizes, you can actually take that whole hub off and just put a new one on. Um, and so that was a good spare to have. Look, I mean, we we were launching in pretty rough, crazy conditions, driving fairly long distances. So, you know, the last thing you want to do be doing was sitting on the side of the road, and yeah, <laughs> instead of being in the water. Okay, okay cool. cool. The um, were you were you one of those crazy um, South African beach launches that we see now on the internet? Uh, no, so um, those launches, uh, that's that's up Durban Way uh, yeah. where, where they do all those kind of crazy launches. In Cape Town, we've got slipways. So there's not there's not really beach launches in, 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 in Cape Town. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I, in George, the area where I, I grew up, um, I got to know this guy who's – his name is Rudolph. Um, give a little shout-out to him. That guy's uh, the, the cracker whacker or the white muscle mm-hmm. cracker. He can he can he can fish them out, but so I've done a few beach launches with him, and it's it's uh, you've really got to know your know your uh, you know surf conditions, be able to read the swell, see where the kind of the the deep spots are, um, you know, in the sandbanks. So it's 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 pretty challenging. Yeah, right. it's some of those um, launches they do over there look absolutely terrifying. I'm not interested in them at all. Oh man, <laughs> absolutely crazy. It is. Right. It is. Shrek, Jeremy Gamble from Spearing Magazine has been in contact with you and he's got a ripper deal, mate. What is it? That's right. He he said to me recently, he said, our our new offer is eight back issues for $30 US <laughs> plus shipping Isaac. He didn't say US because it was implied because he's American, god damn it. He is. And, <laughs> and, and everyone at SpearingMagazine.com is American, but not all of the stories are American. Um, they get some. Oh, where do they come from? Uh, all over. Dan Mann has recently got on, so he's even a bit of Australian stuff in there. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but really? if you want to get hold of this this eight back catalogue issues, you've got to email Jeremy, J E R O M Y, at spearingmagazine.com and just tell him you're interested in the back catalogue and he'll send you a price with chipping. And uh, get hold of that at spearingmagazine.com. Oorah! Thanks for the support, guys. <laughs> we, we've, we've spent a bit of time chatting boats, and it's good to get some uh, some some more information on that. We haven't actually spent much time with that on the show, but uh, Eka, what's a, a memorable fish story? Um, a fish from your sort of spearfishing history that really sticks out? So, uh, one was actually, so I mentioned Rudolph earlier, and um, I'll I'll tell two quick stories. So that Rudolph guy, he's got a great white story for every, almost every day of the week. And so we're, we were cruising on the boat and we we're obviously targeting mussel cracker. Now these mussel cracker, they're incredibly beautiful fish. They're, they're massive. I mean, they, you know, normally your average size is four to like eight kilos, but you know, they can get enormous and they, they're in that white water, in that churning where the waves are breaking. So we're in the boat and we're, we're cruising down the beach and, you know, he's telling us about uh, the last time he dived at this spot. Uh, he was, you know, swimming along the shore and he had his, uh, you know, big, you know, 13, 12 kilo muscle cracker on the float line. And all of a sudden he felt this tugging and he thought, oh, no, there was a seal at the at the float line. So he swam over to the float line and there was this big, great white busy gnawing on his <laughs> on his muscle cracker. And he goes, yeah, that, that's this spot here. So yeah, who's, who's going to jump in first? So, um, yeah, anyway, he loves tell it, like telling you these stories and going, yeah, that's this, this is exactly where this thing happened. So who's, who's going to jump in? <laughs> um, so anyway, so we, we jumped in there and um, you kind of get to know what terrain you're looking for. And I found this, this perfect terrain, like everything just looked absolutely perfect for Muscle Cracker. 
And uh, I swam down and there were these large boulders and I kind of wedged. So with muscle cracker, because you're in the breaking waves, they, it's, the, 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 it's always trying to lift you up and wash you around, but you can't move around for muscle cracker, any kind of sudden movement. And they just bolt like, just light. And you just hear their tail just like doof, 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 doof as they swim away. Mm. So I wedge my knees and my elbows in between the rocks so that I'm not, that I can't get moved around and, I look up into the shallows. It's probably only like you know a meter, a meter and a half deep on the in the shallows. But it just looks absolutely perfect. And I can see there's this big boulder and there's a little gully on the other side. And I see uh, you know three, four fish get sucked out of this gully with uh, with the next wave that came. And they kind of get as the wave goes over me, it pushes them back to the shore, so they get washed back into the gully. But I could see that in their body language that they didn't get a fright because I was there. They just kind of saw me and drifted back. Mm. So I went up, um, did a few, you know, did a little breathe up, and I realized, okay, so this is like they're definitely going to come in again. So I swam down and kind of hunkered down and just waited. And on the next uh, surge, as the the water was drawing off uh, in the shallows, the the whole school just came around this rock. And basically, the first the first fish, I, like I didn't even move my gun. I just pointed, and the first fish that swam in front of the, the spear gun, I pulled the trigger, and you know, he did like three, four kicks. My my spear was like a banana, um, <laughs> but yeah, managed to managed to get this fish in my hands, and you know, like fighting it in the white water with waves breaking, and pulled it out into the slightly deeper water, and um, yeah, that ended up being uh, my biggest muscle cracker, which I was super stoked on. Um, so it's not like the biggest fish I've shot, but it was just just the that um, yeah. element of like of the hunt where you like you find the terrain you're like this is going to work you get down there and like everything comes together you know it's not often that you get those moments where like you think that this is the best place and you yep. you get down there and it is the best place like that doesn't often happen yeah that, they they look like just a ball of muscle those fish too oh man that incre- like you literally if 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 you give them a fright all you hear is do, 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 as their yeah. tails kick away and if, and a big school Obviously, you know, if you hear those tales, that means that you've done something wrong. They've seen you and you haven't seen them. Yeah, right. So, and then they'll swim straight out of the area that you might as well kind of, you, you'll have to swim, you know, you might find that school again if you're lucky, but it, it would be super rare to find it. So, so what did that fish weigh? Uh, 14 kilos on the dot. Oh, nice. Oh, oh, yeah. Hey, super um, the, I was going to say, you were talking there about seals in the area. So is are, are they... Do seals prey upon these fish in the shallows? Is that why? No, no, no. no. They 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 prey on uh, the fish on the back 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 end of your float. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I mean, even here in Melbourne, we have the same. Okay. Yep, so yep. we've got there's a fair amount of seals. Uh, not not crazy amounts, but um, it's definitely a factor. And and obviously, there's you know sharks here that uh, you know in South Africa we've got seven gill sharks or cow sharks, and and here in Melbourne we actually have the same. We've got the the seven gill sharks and the cow sharks here too, and they can be pretty cheeky too. All right, okay. Cool. Yeah. Right. Wicked. Uh, wicked memorable fish there. You said you had two. Uh, well, the other one is just more. Just a just more of like a story of a good day. Um, we in, in South Africa, your your limit for kingfish is is ten fish uh, per person, um, and every now and like literally maybe once or twice a year, you'll get a day where it's just absolute pandemonium. Um, and uh, just we had one day where we where we launched and we got got out and we were the only crazy people enough to launch that day because the the swell and the the, the 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 surge and the slip was just enormous. Um, so we, we got out there and we pretty much had this area just to ourselves and jumped in and it was just. I mean, a school of king, a yellowtail would come by or kingfish would come by literally like almost every five minutes. I I jumped over. It was like I was doing boaty first and I just, all my mates were just throwing, you know, yellowtail on the boat and I was like, oh, sweating. I was like, oh, I just need to get in the water. <laughs> uh, but, you know, w- waited my turn. I had a guy jump over on the boat and I was like, okay, cool. So I jumped in. As I jumped in the water, school swims by. I swim down. I shoot the fish and I swim to the surface and I managed to kill him and I just push him down the shooting line and I put the spear back and I was going to start swimming back to the boat and another school came by and swam down and I'm holding the one fish in my hand and the shooting line's kind of going through it. So I've got to kind of like aim like a little bit higher because another shooting line's going to pull down on the shot and I shoot that fish, no. I get him. I do the same same thing with him and I'm just about at the boat and another school comes past and I've like... I shot the third one, like literally I've got like three uh, yeah, kingfish 
on on the one gun and I'm right at the boat now. So I give the guy on the boat that gun and he passes me another gun and I swim down and shoot another fish that was swimming next to the fish that I just shot previously. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, and yeah, like a day like that, oh man, like literally we were back on shore and cleaning fish at like, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, which is, oh, it's just absolutely, I mean, it's just amazing to have those days where everything comes together, like all the, the time that you put in and the effort, like it just all came together. It was just brilliant. And you're not, so it's not so much the story of a fish, but just that those moments where, you know, you like, you just put in all this time and all this effort and all of a sudden it's just, it all comes together and you have this like amazing day where everything just goes in your favor. Yep. Love that. Love and you're not, you're not filleting fish in the, um, in the Western sun all the, the afternoon sun at two o'clock frying. It's really quite nice. <laughs> well, actually, I find that uh, with so the the yellowtail um, on this in this part of the coastline, they don't get very big. But um, if you froze them whole without gutting them, they they would actually freeze better than if you actually filleted them and then processed that. Oh. So we would just uh, put them in like tough freezer bags and then just freeze them whole. And then obviously, when you want your fish, you take the whole fish out, you defrost it over day, and then prepare it that evening. And then obviously, you can do a whole bunch of stuff with the leftovers, which I might get into a little bit later if we've got some time for that. So, uh, you, did you say guts and all? Yeah, guts and all, everything. Yeah. Right. It's actually quite easy to fill it like a fish, um, or especially a kingfish, because the, the 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 flesh is so like meaty that you can actually fill it straight around the stomach without you know, actually really cutting into the stomach. Yeah, okay. Um, mm. That's the first time I think anyone's – oh, no, I think Daniel Mann said that as well. He said it's probably better to oh. keep the guts in over on a trip where they're sitting on ice for a few days. So, yeah, that's interesting. I think you're the second sort of person that um, sort of does that kind of thing. Let's uh, let's get into hunting technique. So down there in Melbourne – uh let's 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 get into a specific species and oh, let's start with flathead hun- hey how do you, how do you go, go? Ooh, <laughs> what's your technique for flathead uh, i guess there's, there's two tips one is swim a long way and the other yeah. one is swim you want to you've got to cover a lot of ground the hardest thing about flathead is the hardest thing about green jobfish and snapper too it's seeing them seeing yeah. them and and then you're and then you you know like the the thing with with flathead is is all you've got to do is see them with jobfish and snapper and some of the other species you've got to see them first and then you've got to work out okay what's my technique for actually hunting them with flathead there's there's no technique it's just seeing them and then shooting well them. no actually so i find is if you shoot them from behind they tend to tear off easier because your 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 shaft will go straight into the sand it'll almost anchor it mm, okay. and it's easy for them to tear off where if you shoot them um head on so like facing their head mm. uh, because the shaft is uh, kind of at an angle when they try to tear off they swim and they'll swim up your shaft and onto your shooting line okay. so shooting mm. them from the front actually you'll end up losing a lot less right. flathead than, than trying to shoot them from behind and they okay, nice. and they run hard don't they they're real game fish you know they're a challenge yeah oh, they're massive yeah yeah they're, <laughs> they're a real challenge <laughs> well they've, they've got sharp bones so you've got to we've got to watch out for them they got to watch the so you races. use like a, a rife atmosphere <laughs> Stop it! I like to use a you know two of them with a little five meter bungee. Just just when they run real hard, you've got to have that stretch in the bungee between your your, your two atmosphere floats. They they run real hard. Oh, right. they're such a good eating fish though. They've got to be one of the best the best eating fish around. I love a good flathead. Um, mm. All right, on a, on a more serious note, uh, what is a, a, a hunting technique you sort of use regularly to to hunt some of the more uh, you know flighty fish? I guess. Well, um, I, I, I'll, I'll chat quickly about one hunting technique that uh, I think it's a common mistake that, that, that we make as spiros. Um, and then I'd love to talk a little bit about crayfish because I, I yeah. feel that you know, no, yeah. one's, no one's really chatted much about crayfish um, okay. on the show yet. And I'd love to just chat a little bit about that because that's, that's quite it's, – it's a real challenge down here in Victoria and I guess wherever you travel to. Um, but so the one hunting technique that I find that um, you know, I guess we can all always work on is uh, – let, let me tell you a story first and that, that'll kind of highlight this, the, 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 the scenario for me. So I was diving with my brother – uh, back in the early days and he was working this little bomby and I could see him just diving and diving and diving and after a while he called me over and he said oh no there's this uh, it's a it's a called a hullion which is the um, South African national fish there's a school in this area 
and um, you know you just can't get close. And I, and I said, like, look, uh, can do you want to have one more go? And then do you mind if I have a go? So I watched him dive, and so there's this big balmy, and there's this kelp above it, and I see him dive, and it's perfect. Like he's like ambush, like he's like you know wedging himself in the kelp there. And, it, and it, in my mind, as a as a hunter, you know, it kind of you know it makes sense. But I saw this, the, the school of fish, and they just wouldn't come in close. And um, then he came up, I did a breather, I dove down, and what I did was I swam, you know, four or five meters away from the bomb and, and actually put myself on the sand, and there was a bunch of rocks on my right-hand side and this very big bomb on my left, but I was kind of theoretically out in the open, mm. and what I had done was I'd given uh, the fish the structure, if that makes sense. Yep. If So by by you taking the structure, sometimes you can – you, you, you're more threatening because they've got nothing to hide behind. But then by me putting myself in a position where the fish could use the structure and they could theoretically hide behind the structure, I think they felt safe to come closer. So what had happened was the school uh, darted behind these rocks on my right. So I didn't even move. I just moved my gun to kind of the end of those rocks. And I just waited for the school to kind of come filtering out from from behind the rocks um, and, you know, basically plugged the nicest fish. Um, but that's that's an area where we often fall short where like in your head, like, it, you know, you, you're like, you think you're like the, the sniper, but what's, what you've done is you've taken the structure away from the fish yep. and you haven't given them any security to come in closer, to come and feel safe in that space again. Yeah, nice. That's a, yeah, that's a really good point. And it, that actually makes me think about our trip we did to the Coral Sea where – Probably not even thinking about it, I did the same thing with um, with a mew or something very similar to a mew. I think there's a few little different species or up there that are quite similar, but same sort of thing. They, um, yeah, if you're off to the sand, just to the to just away from it a little bit, they'd sort of come to the bommy and cling to it. So I didn't put it together until just then, but um, yeah, that's that's pretty good advice. Yeah, well, look, it's it's just that area where. Fish are naturally inquisitive, but if you uh, behave in a way that's threatening for them, um, obviously they're, they're not going to come in close. But if you if you swim down to an area and they feel safe enough that they're like, oh, I've got this structure to hide behind or this little uh, cave I can swim into real quickly, you know, they'll feel more confident to come in and check you out and obviously, you know, that give you that opportunity on them. That's good advice. All right. All right, cool. And then crayfish. Um, yeah, let's do it. Okay. Okay, let's hook in. Veterans Vault. <laughs> Veterans fault with with Eckhart and crayfish, <laughs> loving on. it. And we and I, I'm hoping I'm hoping we're going to chat a little bit about a bit more about caring for your catch too. So, all right, let's get into crayfish. Where, where do you find them? Look, um, again, it depends where you are in the world. I guess the first, I mean, uh, there's a few things before we get stuck in is always to make sure that you're aware of wherever you're traveling to or wherever you live, what the seasons are for crayfish because it changes all like pretty much everywhere where I've been, hard to catch them. So even in Australia, like in, uh, in Victoria, you know, we're not allowed to use, you can only use your hands. That's it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, there's places where you can use nooses and hooks. Uh, you can shoot them in certain areas. But mm. so you, you you just need to be aware if you're going to go target crayfish, what the regulations are, wherever you're traveling and what those seasons are. Um, it's yeah, it's one, it's the, the fine isn't worth it. And, and two, it's just, you know, it's kind of wise, wise stewardship of, of our, our resources, really. I agree. And like. And crayfish have like a, a period of the year where they're in berry every year, and they'll and they'll have soft shells as well. So it's it's definitely worth with learning about your fishery a bit more. Where 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 did where where do, where do guys find out a bit more about their local fishery? Um, where did you learn in South Africa, and how did you learn in Melbourne? Um, so when I came here, actually, there's a there's a great app that you can download on your phone called Vic Fishing. Now I don't know if the other states have similar apps where you've you can access basically you can access all the fish their size limits the seasons um, the catch limit for the various species so so this app it's called Vic Fishing you can download it on your iPhone app or Android or whatever phone you've got um, so that's that's really easy obviously you can uh, I guess contact any uh, any authority 
where where you're going so you know i did a trip to tasmania and <clears throat> basically just gave them a call i had to buy a license online like in tasmania you don't need a fishing license but you need a license for crayfish so the best is just to, obviously just do online research and find out one who to call i find calling people sometimes a little bit easier because you can try and navigate any uh, uh you know like in Tas- tasmania there's they've got different zones uh, mm. so there might be areas where there's a, a different zones that that you're not aware of as, as a as a traveler like coming to a, a, a new state or a, maybe even a new country you're completely unaware of it so the best is just to try and do as much online research and then also use facebook as a forum like there's so many forums wherever you're traveling to there's going to be like some sort of like spearfishing wherever um you know and use that as a resource and ask questions and you know you, you people like i find people incredibly helpful like when i moved here you know obviously posted heaps of questions and asked as you know as many questions and i got heaps of answers so it's it's uh, you know these online forums and tools can be an amazing tool if you use them correctly all right so we've 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 learned a little bit about the fishery where we where we're located what's the what's the next step so the tools obviously you want to have a tough pair of gloves um mm-hmm. pretty important um down here the 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 holes are so deep and so dark that i remember when i moved in south africa you don't really need a torch like there's lots of crayfish um and and they don't hide as well as they do here in 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 melbourne um so we never use torches um but then moving here i thought oh i I don't need a torch i can find craze and you know i found a couple without a torch but man was it difficult like it was it, it made my life so hard and after i bought a torch i was like i was just you know just it's like that lesson where like sometimes you think you can get away with with without spending money or with or like something cheap and then you buy what you should have bought originally and you're yeah. like why didn't i just buy this yeah, in the yeah. first place like yeah, on our sure. black like that yep <laughs> <laughs> so on that on, on just on that uh, you mentioned gloves mate uh they're just they're a terrible thing the dive glove and everyone whinges about them you work in a store you, you dive for craze you punish gloves what's the just give us a brand, give us a mate, give us a good cray glove. So, again, it depends where you are. Down here in Melbourne, you know, the world is cold. Um, so we're just on the edge of our winter season. So in summer, we'll on the back beaches, maybe get to like 20 degrees, 21. Mm. Um, and then in winter, it'll drop down to like 13 or so. So yeah. it's, it's pretty cool. So, um, you know, ideally you want a Kevlar glove um, uh, down here. You want like a three mil, glo- like the, the, the spikes in the craze here, are in- they're pretty severe. And even with Kevlar gloves and the toughest gloves that I've found, if, if I'm diving specifically for craze, I end up going through gloves like every two months, I'd say. Um, wow. So it's it's one of those things where if, if you're diving for like, so I've actually got like, Cray gloves that are basically just le- like I won't even use them for anything. If I'm going for crayfish, I'll I'll take them. But otherwise, I've got like spear fishing gloves or like my winter warm gloves. But yeah. for crays, they're so hard on your gear, like just nothing survives them. Like it, yeah. you just punish your gear. Like this, like I haven't found one like uh, glove that you know cuts the mustard. They all kind of work, um, but. Okay. Yeah, they, they they just destroy it. They, they gear destroys because I mean you're shoving your hand into caves. And yeah, sure. what I find actually, it's it's not, it's almost the top end of your glove that gets damaged the most because you're you're trying to wedge your hand um, like over the cray, but um, underneath a rock. So it's that top end of the fingers that get like where you get holes first. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's I mean you just destroy gloves. Do you have have you ever bought that? The hardware, the hardware gloves that have got like, um, like flexible glue coating on the outside of them, and you wear them over over top. I, I haven't. Um, I like to have. I haven't tried that. I mean, it's not a bad suggestion because it's like you know, like those little Dyneema like uh, gloves that you can get at uh, Bunnings and and wherever, and just put them yeah. over your gloves. But I like to if if you. Sometimes if you're uh, grabbing a cray, you want a little bit of sensitivity so that you can kind of feel if you're grabbing a leg or a horn mm. and where uh, mm. how the cray is sitting. So sometimes you might not even be able to see him, but you can feel him. Um, so you need to have some sensitivity on like where he's sitting so that you can get a good grip on him and then basically shake him like crazy <laughs> until he lets go. Yeah, my uh, mate of ours that we used to dive with um, – Jamie Luff, he actually would get wetsuit glue and paint it on. 
because it seems to be the seam around the fingers that lets go a lot, the stitching, but he, he would actually put huge amounts of um, the neoprene glue over the seams and he would do it every so often and he, he actually stretched those gloves out for donkey's ages. I couldn't believe how long they would last those things. So I've actually done something similar with, with silicone at one time Yeah, and, and I find that that was pretty cool. Like it, it seemed to work pretty well. Yeah, okay. So it's the same same principle, I guess. Um, and then the other thing with craze, I find is um, it's it's better to do it as a team sport. Now, so down here, um, finding the craze is probably half the problem. So what I do personally is I change my diving style completely. So when I'm in that like search phase, one, I'll basically clip my gun float line and, and, and float off on my buddy's float line. And for me, I view it as a team sport. So it enables me to, to swim around and under caves. So in one dive, I can maybe do three or four caves where if, if you've got a float line behind you, it's hard for you to get under a cave properly without getting snagged somewhere. Um, so it enables me to like maybe swim down a gully and then check a cave out, really swim into it, have a good look, swim on, have a look under one other ledge where otherwise if you're swimming around with your float line, it, it just becomes a burden and a hassle. So it enables me to, to actually cover a little bit more ground uh, and actually kind of identify or, or find the craze quicker. Um, and then once we find them, then we can spend a bit of time working on them. Yeah. And it also defeats that other objective where you can maybe, if you're swimming with a gun, maybe like anchoring your gun at one point and then swimming around, but then you're swimming back over ground that you've covered before to get back to your gun to then go to a new ground. So I find that's almost like wasting that time. So we'll, I normally swim with a buddy and we'll, we'll work in one direction um, so that we're not covering ground that we've done before. And then we could maybe come back on a, maybe a deeper line or a shallower line to try and you know cover different new ground. Yeah. So, I, so I find that that way I can I I shorten my recovery period instead of doing like super long dives and I've got to you know stay on the surface for uh, you know you know uh, you know four or five minutes. I find it better to do shorter shorter dives where you're, you're keeping that energy and once you find that crayfish, then you can be like, okay, you can get up there, do a proper breather uh, and really strategize on how to approach him, which hand to grab him, should you be upside down, should you. Uh, down here in Victoria, the, the, the horns and the feelers of the crayfish actually go upward. Mm -hmm. So it's it's actually quite hard to do a over the top grab for for the crazier. It's not impossible, but uh, they ret they can retreat quite quick because they can actually sense your hand coming because your hand's got to go past the feelers before it gets to the actual uh, you know carapace where you can grab it. Yeah. Mm. So no, no, go on. So so what are you doing? You're grabbing them around them or something. Well, okay. Well, there's a couple of ways to skin a cat, obviously, but mm -hmm. uh, a good good way is actually putting your hand with your palm up on the ground and actually try to slide it underneath the cray. The the danger, obviously, with that is if you grab too deep, uh, you know, obviously the cray can grab you and, the, you know, those legs are incredibly strong. So you've got to be pretty careful. But ideally, you can then just, uh, you know, grab from underneath and, and grab the horns like that instead of going over the top. Right. Yeah. Does that make sense? I'm like, I'm yeah, like yeah, yeah, no. Well, I'm, I'm just trying to think because realistically, the only thing I've ever chased is – the um, the painted cray and I was just trying to think are the legs yeah. that strong that they'd actually physically oh. hurt me and I couldn't I wouldn't think oh, that they, they are. Will. Last year I was in New Zealand and those things will they'll they'll tear you a new one they'll 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 they'll, they'll penetrate you penetrate right through into the muscle and hurt you bad. And let's uh, let's, no. let's let's keep, let's keep it civil. That's, that's <laughs> the wrong language to use. <laughs> In, in Victoria, are, they're incredible. I mean, they'll tear your wetsuit. So, I mean, you've got to be careful. If, if you let them too, too close to you, they'll they'll literally tear a hole straight through your wetsuit. They're incredibly strong. Okay. Yeah, last year, last year I was in Taranaki with Pat, and, and we just went pretty much cray diving. And um, I ended up pulling out a, a good-sized buck. is about three three kilo or something. Those things have got – if their legs get hold of you, like, yeah, you, you're in for a good, a good touch-up. And um, – I think one thing one thing I learned, um, especially free diving, like when you're scuba diving for craze, it's much easier because you've got more time. But when you're free diving, like when when I was scuba diving, you could put a bit of weed in front of your hand, and you could sneak right until you're almost touching their horns. Now, nah, really, because because their horns will get their, their their feelers will go out, and then they'll come back in again, and then like it, and so you can just slowly creep your hand forward. But when you're free diving, you haven't got like two minutes to get one cray. So it's a it's a very it's a much faster sort of procedure, but um, I think uh, the 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 other biggest thing I learned was sealing off the sort of their back entrance. If they've got 
too many places to go. It's they're, they're much a much tougher um, animal to grab. Yes, I mean you can you you know you can put your gun behind them so that try and block their retreat um, or try to make sure. So I've you can chase a cray uh, if there's a, if there's only one other exit and your buddy's at that exit, you can literally chase that cray straight into your buddy's hands. Oh, um, yeah. Again, it, you can actually. It can be a team sport, if you know what I mean. Like you can actually, your one buddy can cover the one entrance, you can cover the other one, um, and literally just um, like they, you'll just chase him straight out. And then at the end of the day, he he gets the head and you get the tail. That just seems <laughs> seems logical. Seems fair, yeah. <laughs> or or you you uh, might find that you'll uh, see the exit and you might have a better grab from the exit, grabbing them on the tail and literally yeah. just yanking them straight backwards. Yeah, right. Right. I haven't grabbed many crays from behind, to be honest. Um, <laughs> no, I mean like. <laughs> oh, stop no, it! No, I'm not, I'm not even being dirty here. I mean like whenever you're chasing them in New Ze- whenever you're chasing them in New Zealand, like. You, you don't you don't get to see a crayfish from behind because they're always head first outside the back of a, you know, facing towards you out of a crevice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's rare you get one in the open. You, you can you can also distract them with one hand and then move your other hand from the side and try to like basically bear hug the thing. Yeah. So you know, there's you can approach them as you're saying. Even with scuba, you're saying you know slowly creeping your hand forward. You could do something similar with even with free diving. You're slowly like kind of distract them with one hand where there's you move some movements and you can see that they they're inquisitive. They'll actually come and have a look uh, or, or just distract them enough for you to actually get closer with the other hand. Um, and then I find uh, uh, you know a, a really good technique with a grab is a lot of people grab from their elbow. If you if you kind of uh, thrust from your shoulders, um, you tend to get a lot more reach. Uh, and you know, there's there's a greater chance of you actually and like, and I'm normally trying to grab like at least 10, 10 centimeters behind the crayfish because by the time I'm on him, you know, he's he's ten centimeters back. So you, yeah. that, that, you you you're kind of adjusting for his 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 escape. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, yeah, it's just unusual. Like I've never really got to approach crays from anywhere behind him. Like when I was in when I was doing scuba diving, you could you could go right into a hole and. And, and, you know, you can see them all over the place. But generally, like, diving in crevices, they're always sort of facing outwards. And so you only get a front-on approach. And so it's very much just getting past that front line of defense, which is their, their feelers, and then, you're, and then you're good as gold. Yeah. And then, obviously, you know, you want to try and grab them, you know, as close to the base of those two horns as you possibly can. Because yeah. um, that's basically the strongest area. Um, and, I mean, obviously, if they lock into a cave there, a good technique there is to actually shove them backwards because they sometimes get confused. And then it's easy just to pull them straight back out. Or you just sometimes have to, you know, shake them left and right and up and down and as many ways yeah, as you yeah. can just to kind yeah. of dislodge them. Oh, so they're, good- they, they're quite literally... They back in, and all the sprawl, horn, all the spikes on them face forward, right? So that's that's all they're doing, just so that you can't pull them forward out of the little hole. Yeah. Well, I, I've actually had the crays here. Yeah, they'll they'll almost push up into the roof. So I've had one cray where I pulled him so hard that the top of his shell was almost like normally they're spiky. It was almost smooth as I, as as he like grated on the on the roof of this cave. So they, they they really try to wedge themselves in there. It sounds like yeah, if they, if they sprawl, it's a good arm wrestle, and that's how you tear your gloves apart too because like, you got hold of their horn and you're going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, just ramming them back in and out. It's good fun. I was going to say a, a, a cool trick I learned from Kimmy Werner in a, in a magazine ages ago. She, she Like w- with newbies following them, they always leave feelers and legs and stuff everywhere. You know, like it's just like you don't – New, new guys don't grab the horns like you say. They don't grab far enough back, and so they end up snapping feelers and legs off. But if if you le- if you leave those feelers and the and the legs in the hole, those crayfish that live in that hole will move somewhere else. It's like a warning sign for them. So it's like take oh, all your like... excess legs and feelers with you when you go, and then that hole will still be good next time. I never knew that. Mm, I remember reading it in a Kimmy Werner article a couple of years ago, and I thought that was pretty neat. Uh, it's mm. a good way to sort of look after your hidey holes. Yeah, or or I mean, if you if you catch a cray and and he drops a leg or two, you know, swim down and get it because I mean, you know, the legs is in my opinion, it's like that's the best meat, man. Like that's 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 that's, that's the best stuff to eat. How, how big are these um, like a, crays that you're you're chasing down there? <laughs> So, oh, they they get pretty big here, man. Like, um, like the biggest I've caught is three point seven kilos. 
But I mean, I've I've had friends that have caught four plus, like five yeah. kilos, um, and we've had I've chatted to customers that have caught bigger than five kilos. So it's they can get absolutely. I mean, when you see them underwater, your your heart stops, man. Like it's it's it looks like a dinosaur looking at it, like at you. Like it's just it's amazing. Do you guys get pack hmm. horse craze there? No, 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 no. We just get uh, the the uh, southern southern uh, crayfish. Now, eating wise, mate, are they are they are these things exceptional? Are they a lot better than the northern crays that we get? To be honest, I, I haven't had any of uh, any other species of crayfish here in Australia. I've actually only had the southern, and they're incredible eat. Like, look, so I can't compare it to anything else, but mm. they're incredible eating. Like, even I find in South Africa, the bigger crayfish didn't always taste that nice. Um, you know, the problem is a lot of people don't have a pot big enough. I mean. You've got to understand, like, you need, like, a absolute, like, a, you know, one of those, like, soup witch cauldron things to actually boil yeah. one of these or steam one of these things. They're, they're so big that you literally, <laughs> you know, sometimes have to, like, do half the crayfish at a time. Like, they're just enormous. That's awesome. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Mate, do, what... do, you guys do, them on a, do you guys do them on a barbie cut? Like, just cut them up the, up the middle and, and do them on the barbecue? So, you... I, well, I've, I've done that before, but... I find that if you do if you do a crayfish like that from raw, um, the meat will stick to the shell because it gets kind of overcooked on the side, so it's hard to get the meat the meat out of the shell. So, if you want to do it that way, the best is to parboil the crayfish, and then by then that the if you parboil it, the legs are done anyway. So, I normally what I do then is I break the legs off, and that can be like a little starter in a bowl, and then obviously you split your cray, and you can you know do garlic butter and you know whatever kind of marinade you want, and then you can barbecue you can barbecue the the crayfish fish like that and you'll find that the the meat and the tail will actually come out like nice like the whole thing will come out it won't get stuck to the actual shell which is okay. much better that's a great tip nice all right nice. um okay like we could talk about food forever um with shrek but um what mate what about uh like finding finding good crayfish holes like it, i just asked this question because something that stands out in my mind is when we spoke to um uh, geez, the guys from California, they were talking about um, certain holes for lingcod. Um, uh, Jim Russell, it was. He was talking about lingcod holes, and he's saying that they they best if they face away from the predominant swell. Any sort of thing like that with crayfish, or did I just waste a sentence? <laughs> no, no, actually, no. It's it's story. very again. It depends, I guess, on species. So in South Africa. It's like they actually like to face the the surge because food's coming in and out of their hole, like those cracks and uh, crevices the whole time. I found here in Victoria, uh, sometimes it's like that, but the predominant like times when I find crays, generally the holes are facing away from uh, either the current or the swell. Uh, so just depending on on where you're diving, uh, it, it might not be hun- like 180 degrees away, but it might be at like 90 degrees of where the the swell is going. So they're, they they definitely like a little bit more of a protected area. So sometimes you'll find is you'll swim down and you'll see this big like horizontal crack, but then there's a ledge, and then instead of facing into the crack, they'll be under the ledge that's facing the crack. If that makes sense. So they're completely protected under there. Um, so yeah, it's it's um, it's definitely a factor. Like I'm, I'm not sure, like in you know what the crazy are like where, where you guys are, but um, there's definitely an element to that uh, down here in Victoria. Some sometimes with um, with species you get like signalling um, things, you know, like other species in the area that sort of indicate that you know you're in a good spot, or you know, like I remember in Wellington there's a sort of a weed that grows on the bottom, and if you see it, it's like you, you're in a good area to find craze. Have you got anything like that? Is there any sort of uh, weed or kelp or um, you know maybe sea urchins or something else that. <laughs> uh, um, so obviously uh, sometimes you get these little Port Jackson sharks in, in the caves, uh, and that can always be a signal. Uh, just obviously to look behind it. Sometimes so I went diving actually uh, with Swen uh, your uh, the previous interview that you guys did um, mm-hmm. maybe three four weeks ago and we were diving and I found about six small crayfish. Uh, they weren't size. I obviously didn't try to catch them. But when you see crayfish, you'll often find, and especially like so here in Victoria, if you find like a female, you'll often find another female in the vicinity. Uh, but if you find a female, you'll definitely there'll be a male somewhere in that area. And so I had looked in that area 
quite extensively because I thought uh, there must be another cra- like uh, there must be a bull that's looking after these crows or that's 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 the, these are his the, these are his little ladies and um, I couldn't find anything. We swam on and then actually on the way back I swam down and I found this like this really nice bull. Swam down, I grabbed him and then when I went down to check that area again, he was literally a meter away from where those eight smaller crayfish were sitting. Um, so he'd obviously, he was probably so deep that I never saw him and it come out in that gap that we had, you know, uh, swam past and come back. Oh. So it's, it's, if you see, if you see some crays, um, and they're not sized, just check the area, um, because you might, you might find some more. All right, yeah. cool. All right, cool. Any other parting tips for crayfish? Um, I'm trying to think actually. We, we covered a fair bit of ground. I had a question for you. Do you ever freeze your crayfish, mate, and does it freeze well? So I've tried, okay, I have tried a lot of different ways to try and find a good way to freeze them. Um, I have parboiled them and frozen them. I have frozen them fresh, so just, just like that. Um, and I've frozen them fully cooked. Now, f- I find that the, the parboiling seems to work really well. Um and I found that if you – so just recently, that cray that I caught, um, because they're so – I mean, that cray was 2. I don't know, 2.5 kilo, 2.7 kilos. Like it was a good solid cray. Like yeah. my wife and I, we, we just had the legs. That's one meal on its own. And, and they're yeah. kind of like the knuckles in the chest. Like the, you know, that's, that's like the knuckle meat. And, and took it out of the shell because obviously once it's parboiled, it's super easy to get out. And then I just actually – uh, let that cool down, and I vacuum sealed that, and that it, it freezes really well if you if you take it out and, and vacuum seal it. So I'm a uh, maybe about f- three years ago, I bought myself a really nice vacuum sealer, and um, I actually spend a lot of time like if I if I have a good catch of of fish, I will spend like oh, I don't know hour and a half or so just filleting, deboning everything, um, and then portioning it in sizes for you know either two or four people, yep. uh, and then and then vacuum sealing. It and then I'll, I'll label that little bag, you know, whatever the name of fish it is, and then the date, so that I, when I'm scratching through my freezer, I know what I'm grabbing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Right, um, cool. Well, okay. No, here's here's something that's interesting. Um, so your crays tend to bleed out um, quite a lot or very easily. So obviously, if you've uh, have you ever tried to uh, store a cray in your fridge, maybe? Yep. Yes. Yeah. So have you noticed if if maybe if you've if you've broken a leg off that there's this black liquid yep. at the bottom of the whatever they're in mm-hmm. yeah, and often yeah. that it'll smell pretty funky um so there's two things one if you're going to try and store it in your fridge for like a, like let's say if you do a late session and, and you don't have time to eat it that night if you're going to put it in your fridge try to uh, uh seal the container with like lad wrap so that, that the crayfish doesn't dry out um so if it gets injured obviously that blood's going to congeal um and you know it's it's quite like i said it's quite smelly so in that instance i'd probably recommend try to uh, prepare or cook that crayfish as soon as possible and then you know you can always store a cray like the meat that's cooked um in your fridge yep okay um the other question i had there'll be a lot of young blokes out there that don't know what par boiling is despite jamie oliver's best efforts what um (laughs) what's par boiling mate can you explain that to us just quickly yeah, of course. So, um, par boiling is uh, like I think of your crayfish. Uh, you can either cook it a hundred percent. So, yep. so par boiling is cooking it. You know, twenty, not even thirty percent, but like twenty or th- like somewhere around there. Like really, just basically letting the the shell change color. Okay. Um, I find that if you cook it more than that, then you. So the thing with crayfish and with fish, everything like that, if you overcook it, it can be. Mm. You can save it by making another dish, but <laughs> generally, as it is, it's 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 ruined. If that makes sense, yep. like you you can save it by making like a crayfish curry then, or um, doing something other something else that's unique with, with with the crayfish or the fish. But as a standalone thing, it, you can you can overcook it. It can, can you can spoil it pretty easily. So if you, you're cooking it to like thirty percent max um you know that that's what i would think of as like par boiling do you chuck that in uh with the water on the boil or do you put that in and let the 
because I know with I know with Jamie's um, extra crispy roast potato, it's done quick. He uh, when he par boils, you put them in the water cold and bring them to the boil, and then you put them in the oven. And he calls that par boiling. Is that what you're doing, or you're throwing the crayfish in when it's boiling? Yeah, when it's boiling. Right. So you can obviously put your your cray in the in the freezer for like maybe forty minutes, or depending on how big it is, yep. just to basically, uh, you know. Put it to sleep, yep. um, and then um, oh. yeah, get, get your water boiling. Get a nice like uh, I, I, I ideal would be like uh, you know seawater, salt water. But you know we can just always add your salt, mm-hmm. um, and then and then putting it in there. Uh, you I've can also a, steam it. Sorry, yeah, go for it. I've got a couple of pet hates of crayfish. Um, number one, uh, <laughs> number one is is not so bad, but it's overcook overcooking them. Some guys do it all the time. They they overcook it, and the meat's just like you're not even eating a crayfish. You're just eating something that doesn't even taste like one. So I'm right. On, I'm on the same page as you of par boiling. The other pet hate I have is guys that don't kill their crayfish and they put them in boiling water live. I just think like you can actually hear a cra- when you, you can hear crayfish screaming when you do it, and I, I don't like it. Um, an, an old scuba diving instructor taught me how to icky them, and you just stick your knife up through underneath. Um, where their legs and the top of the tail join, and you can stick your knife up into their brain and kill them. It doesn't, it, it, in my opinion, it improves their eating quality, and I think it's far more humane. So what I find is that, like again, I mean, it's um, what I find is that if there's any hole in the carapace, like if you've torn a leg off, water will get in there into the carapace, and it kind of changes the texture of the meat. Okay. So I, that's why I prefer like chucking them in the freezer for a bit. Um, versus that, I mean, look, they they both get the job done, but I, I try to get as little uh, water in inside the carapace of the crayfish as possible. Okay, yeah, right. Hmm. Okay, Mate, fair enough. Yeah, that's that's good. Mate, what have you got anything that we haven't covered on um, crayfish? It seems pretty uh, comprehensive. Comprehensive. Actually. Maybe the one thing is like is hard to approach grabbing a crayfish. So the one thing that that I do, I don't know if any of you guys have done rock climbing, where sometimes you can look at a wall and you can look at the grips and go, okay, I'm gonna, you know, right hand's gonna grab here and my foot's gonna go there. So you can kind of like mentally figure out your climb. So I I do something similar with a crayfish where I'll swim down and I'll I'll look at him because so here you you know it might take you an hour to find one crayfish. You know, like it's you, you're looking, so you want to make sure of your grab. So I will go have a look at that cray and see where he's sitting and try to go, okay, should I come in on my back? Will I have a better lunge that way? Should I come in? Uh, is my left hand going to be a better grab than my right hand? Is like, so you're trying to figure out how to approach and which, which way in terms of how to adjust your body that you're going to get the most reach and the best grab on that cray as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of, I guess I overanalyze it, but I'll, I'll, I'll literally stand on the, like li- be lying on the surface of my breather, trying to like just picture where the cray is and try to picture how I'm going to like, you know, trying to grab this cray with which hand I'm going to grab. And then once I've decided which hand I'm going to grab, that's, I've kind of locked it in place and I'll, and I'll try to execute that. That's that pretty cool analogy. So if it's, if it's wow. taken an hour to find a cray, it's only going to take 10 seconds to lose it, isn't it, really? Not even that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not even that. Yeah. yeah. That's infuriating losing crays when they slip back into the back of a hole and you've got no chance of getting them. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Or they're sitting so deep that you just you can see them, but like there's no way you're reaching them. Yeah, that's a that's another thing. Guys sometimes get stuck in those holes, and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You you got to be pretty careful, man. Like so, obviously, you know, with your weight belt or if you uh, so down here, obviously we're wearing thick wetsuits. So oh. if you're wearing a, a one of those uh, weight vests, uh, you know, they they can be uh, have a tendency to to snag up. So that's where, again, with buddy diving. Um, you know, you can have prearranged signals. So, like most of the guys down here, if you cross your fins, yep. um, that means that your buddy must grab you and pull you out, f- basically by your fins, so that you can because that means you're stuck. Yeah, we got taught the same thing. It's a it's a good signal, and it's another good reason to buddy dive when you're doing cray diving. Um, the other thing I was going to say when you're pulling a guy out of a hole, <laughs> don't pull him out too hard. Like I, I, I was in a hole one day and I had an over enthusiastic buddy start pulling me out for no reason at all. <laughs> and he was panicked. Mate. He's, He's panicked and he's like wrenching me out and my head is rammed into the top of this friggin' cave. I was furious when I got out and I was just about to grab this cray too. I was so angry. Oh my gosh, that is brilliant. 
but yep, no, I'd rather have an over-enthusiastic over buddy than an absent one, so it's all good. 100%, man. Howtofreedive.com is a fantastic resource for Spiros. They offer a course called The 5-Minute Freediver that... It goes for 28 days where Pete Ryder guides you through breath hold techniques. And in the end, it enables you to do a five-minute static breath hold or very close to it. So if you want to improve your breath hold and you don't get to the water as much as you'd like, check it out. It's howtofreedive.com. And, of course, use the code NoobSpiro and you'll save yourself 20%. Guys, today's Noob Spiro podcast is brought to you by hexaquatic.com. Now, head back to our episode with Warren Bird from Hex and to get a full rundown on full Q&A. But basically, this, this suit utilizes a new technology that helps you to be more stealthy. And not only is the technology unique to Hex, but the suits are actually well made themselves using high-grade Yamamoto neoprene. They are two degrees Celsius warmer than most wetsuits, and they're actually very well constructed and more uh, robust more durable than than most of the suits on the market so check them out at hexaquatic.com if you want to know a bit more head back and listen to our interview with hex creator warren bird all right let's close out craze and let's move on to the funniest thing what's the funniest thing you've experienced out spearfishing oh so funny enough uh, crazy things tend to follow this guy rudolph that i told you about earlier um so this is like i think it's one of those things where it's like it was crazy when it happened, but funny in retrospect. <clears throat> so we, we're diving this coastline again, kind of where I grew up. But it's it's um, it's you're diving basically on the back line, and um, you drop the divers off just behind where the waves break, and they swim into kind of the impact zone area. And you know they were just working the shoreline along the reef, and we just dropped two divers off, and Rudolph was sitting on the, this little like a, a, a pontoon boat with a little center, cent- like sit down console. So you were sitting on there yeah. and I was, it was my turn to drive the boat. Um, but we kind of moved like, I don't know, 50 meters or 80 meters out so that he could dress up. And then I was going to, we we're going to swap places and I was going to drop him off in the shallows. And so we're busy chatting. He's got his one foot on and you know, like we're, we're kind of looking at the shore and this is like that moment where you like drop your guard. Like we were in our heads. We were like, we're far out enough, not, for anything to be an issue and we just hear this like crackling we look behind us and there was this like six foot wave tearing down at us oh. and oh. it was just that moment where you know you're like your heart just hits your feet and you're like this is <laughs> this sucks this is just the worst place to be and i'm like sitting in the nose of the little boat and he managed just to swing one motor in and he gets it in gear and he points the boat at the wave and, but we only have the one motor going, so we don't really have a lot of momentum. Yeah. And we hit this wave, and I'm like, I'm basically hugging around the nose of my boat with my two hands, and the boat falls backwards onto the transom and does like a this weird bunny hop, and we land basically on the hull surfing the wave, like the whiteboard, like the wave broke over us, and we, I don't know how, but somehow we ended up like surfing the wave towards the shore. But now what uh-huh. wanted to happen was... The, the basically the boat's caught in the whitewash so the motors can't because of the cavitation yeah. in the whitewash yeah. the motors not they're not turning mm-hmm. so you get the other motor going and we manage to break free we turn and we hit the foam and like at this point like the whole the, the whole boat is full of water and we hit the foam but we didn't have enough momentum to go over and we get pushed towards the, like we get pushed towards the the beach again and then we just hightailed it straight on like towards the rocks and he was like listen just hold on this is i don't know how shallow this is going to get um and we basically just headed straight to the basically onto the beach it felt like turned around and then hit hit the, the whole set going through and we got to the back and we just like I mean, we're just laughing, but it's like adrenaline, I guess, kicking in. But it's just that moment where you're just like, it's just the craziest, yeah. craziest experience. And the crazy thing was, I mean, there's there's just fish floating everywhere. <laughs> there's just like fins and everything. And like the crazy thing was we like didn't lose the thing. We didn't even lose a fish. Like everything was right there floating around. We just kind of picked everything up and, you know, got everything in place again. We're just, just laughing. And the guys on the, obviously, that were like, we nearly went over their heads. They were just, yeah, they they couldn't believe what they'd just seen. So it was just, just crazy. So do you have any 
you have any takeaways from that? Just let the motors run so that you're always ready in case, you know, there's a there's a freak wave or a, uh, a freak swell. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Good call. <laughs> uh, next part of the show is dive bag. So head to toe, what do you, what's, your, what's your dive kit, Eckhart? Oh, man. So I am a little bit of a gear whore. I'm, I'm just not going to lie. Um, uh, so I use a whole bunch of different little bits and pieces depending on where I'm diving, if I'm free diving, if I'm diving deep or shallow. So I've, I've really struggled to find a mask that suits my face. I've got quite pronounced like uh, bone structure. So I actually use a, a single frame, the, the Mare's Essence mask. Um, and I find that that's it's a single frame lens, and, but it can get actually pretty close to your face. So it's not like a actually yeah, like a super high volume mask so uh that's one of my like go-to masks that i use most of the time that mm-hmm. and uh a kind of a cheap like seiko dive mask that i found uh oh, like years ago and i basically bought four of them when they were cheap like i just if i find a mask that fits me i'm like i'll buy four and then yep. that's that'll be my mask and actually last year i found an old cressy mask um i think it's the Occhio plus um, now they stopped. Chrissy stopped making them, unfortunately. But I found a shop in New Zealand that had them, and I basically bought three of them from him so that I could have a low volume mask. If 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 something happens to it, I've I've got backup, <laughs> basically. Yeah, cool. Cool, cool. Um, and right. I just use a, a simple J snorkel, like a, the, I'm using a Mari's Essence J snorkel. So just a simple. It's a bit of a wider bore, so it breathes easier. And um, what's the pros and cons with bore size on a snorkel? I find the, the bigger the bore, the easier it's going to breathe. But obviously, the harder it's going to be to clear. Um, if you have a super big bore, it's like it breathes super easily. But you'll find that to clear it, I mean, you're going to have to really blow pretty hard to clear that water. Mm. Okay, cool. Good All question, right, good Shrek. I like it. I like it. Oh. Then wetsuits. Um, look, the water temp here gets crazy cold so um and i'm an abnormally i'm like i'm I'm fairly tall um, and i don't weigh a great deal so i find an extra large is just it's long enough but it's too big for me so Mm -hmm. i actually get um uh, custom suits made in south africa from uh, rob allen okay um with a bit of extra length in the arms um and and legs and waist for the jacket Uh, and i find that 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 just makes a bit of a to have a bit of a better fit just makes such a difference yep. Um, yep. in terms of length. Um, so uh, we dive in pretty much a five mil, or I dive in pretty much a five mil all year round. Even though in summer it can be a bit warm, but you know you just flush it with a bit of water. Yeah. Um, and then in winter I'll actually go up to a seven mil, or have a combination of maybe a seven mil jacket, and then a five mil farm john. Um, but then. With that, you have the added thing of like having extra weight. So you want to, you don't like for myself, I don't want all that weight on my waist. Uh, so having like a weight vest helps you just kind of distribute a little bit of that weight. So you're not take, you're not wearing all the weight on your vest, but just you're taking some of that weight off your, like your lower back, Yeah, uh, which yep. can really make such a difference on, you know, long dives. And what, what, um, what vest do you like? Man, I, I've recently, so I've been using the an old Spora sub vest that I bought eight years ago, hmm. um, but I find that it's it's uh, riding too high, like almost choking me a little bit. So um, I've recently switched over to the Ocean Hunter weight vest, yep. um, okay. and yeah, I find that that sits a little bit lower. The, the the clip at your chest it sits a little bit lower, so I find that that's a bit easier. But you've got to with all these weight vests, you've got to use that little anchor system on your weight belt, so it doesn't feel like it's going over your head when you're swimming down. And then I just use a uh, a, a silicon weight belt. Um, and um, I actually the interesting thing is um, it's it's hard to get actually, but uh, you know like your free diver weights, um, you know the slide not not the weave through like the old school like the three pound weights, but the the slide through weights. Um, that you like, there's like a little slit in the weight where the yep. the, the weight belt goes through. Yeah, like a um, yeah. So I find that those are a lot easier because if I'm again, if you for me, if I if I'm changing the thickness of my suit, I need to add more weight. Or if I'm uh, going to dive deep that day, if I'm teaching a free dive course, I might need to take off like two three kilos. So uh, it's nice to be able to then just quickly slide off, you know, uh, three or four blocks. And then I can easily reposition uh, the the blocks around my waist correctly, 
instead of then having to reshuffle the whole thing and try to work work on an adult, I can actually just, uh, while it's around my waist, um, uh, I can just actually reshuffle it on my waist, which is oh, quite yeah. nice. Mate, where do you get them? Because I've seen guys with them, or I haven't seen them in the shops. Yeah, so um, Adreno does have some of them. Um, and the ones I've got, I've bought actually when I was in, when I came over from South Africa, I came over with tons of gear. So actually, I brought mine from uh, Rob Allen uh, way back when. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. So I actually, I actually came over with them. Um, but they're 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 actually relatively hard to get you. But Adrena does does have them. They're called the little. Uh, I think they're just called the free diver weights. Okay. okay. Cool. Yeah. And then okay. um, spear guns. Look, I've got a collection. <laughs> Um, I, I, I try too many stuff to be honest. Um, favorite gun? Oh, it depends. Okay, so <laughs> favorite Melbourne gun? Dirty water Melbourne. So look, my all round my all round gun is uh, an eighty centimeter gun, eighty centimeter Rob Allen. Okay. Um, I also have a short short gun for night diving, which we do here in Victoria. Okay. Um, I then have. Uh, for my back beach dives and kingfish or yellowtail uh, on the back beach, I'll dive with a 1.1, the the new roller from Rob Allen okay. uh, with the ceramic bearings. And like I've tried heaps of rollers, like just too many. And this is by far the nicest roller in terms of design and use that I've ever used. Like it, okay. it's it's unbelievable. Like I've Oops. yeah, I, I haven't seen much much that, that that could even come close to uh, you know when it comes to performance or just um how it works it's just it's unbelievable we we chatted to rob allen just before his roller sort of hit the market and i remember him talking to about how much testing went into it so it's good to hear some po- some positive also, stuff quite a few of the, the the prototypes as they were kind of developing it and i mean the one thing like you know you can say about the rob allen guns they're not like the prettiest guns but you when they it's like he didn't just come out with the roller like you know possibly some other companies but you know it took him i think like five six years before he even came out with something uh that was at a kind of a customer level that you can go go out and go purchase but you can see the thought that's gone into it when you actually look at the roller head like the it's it's well thought out there's no there's nothing that you can fault him on on the actual head itself like it's it's amazing yeah, cool. nice. That sounds good. All right. Um, look, let's move on to fins. What are you What are you using in the way of fins? Um, so my go-to fins at the moment is uh, there are two fins that I'm using uh, probably the most. Is one is the uh, Alamani's. So they make those wooden roller guns. Okay. okay. Um, so they do a fiberglass blade with like a thirty degree angle. Um, now the bigger the angle, your surface swimming is just is just unbelievable. So I've had like knee surgery like 10 years ago and like so my knees are, well, my one knee is like crazy sensitive. So if I sh- kick with a hard blade or a stiff blade, it just, it literally seizes up and I feel like I can't walk for like a day or two. Um, yeah. So I I use these, like they're incredibly soft and they've got a massive angle, like a three degree angle, which is pretty massive. So, and because here in Victoria, we I cover a lot of ground. Um, your surf, like being able to kick like for hours on a surface swim is super important. So I find that is just great. And then I'm also using a set of uh, soft, uh, uh, short dive bars. Um, and the shorter blades, it's a little bit more convenient because the caves that we are uh, swimming in for craze and stuff, they're so deep that, you know, like sometimes these longer blades can be a little bit cumbersome okay. um, when you're trying to like wedge yourself into a little hole and, you know, you're kicking around and, it's, and then you're trying to like work your way back out. Yep, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I used to set a um, penetrator, the shorter rock hopping ones with the Kevlar, and um, I love those things. They're awesome. A um, little bit little bit shorter, way less cumbersome, and um, probably better for me with my really crap, crappy rolling ankles as well to have a shorter blade. <laughs> Honestly, I think uh, like shorter blades um, have been – like I've always thought longer is better, but I've – after recently starting to go to slightly sh- like shorter blades, like I, I I really like what they do for my kicking style. So I, like I, I really like them. Like just a slightly shorter blade. Yeah. All right, cool. Last of your uh, gear wrap up, right. Eka. What else you got? 
Let's see what else. Uh, so I use a big blue torch, like a little uh, rechargeable 1,200 lumen torch for my Cray torch, which is a little bit of an overkill. But I find that these torches with batteries in them, just, just such a pain because you go diving for, for Crays and then they're okay for like one dive, but not really okay for the second. And then you've got a drawer full of like, you know, 300 like batteries that you just don't know which battery to use. So yeah, yeah. again, it's one of those things where I just should have bought a rechargeable torch initially. Uh, and having bought one, uh, you know, a few years ago, I was like, this is just, why didn't I do this? 200 lumen torch. Uh, and that's one of my backup torches for a night dive. Uh, but that's my cray torch there. I've put like a little yellow lanyard on it because, you know, obviously with all this stuff, if you drop it, you want to be able to find it. So I put a little yellow lanyard on it. Um, and that helps, you know, if, if, if I drop it, I'm going to, going to track it down that's what, a clever um, idea what brand did you say i missed it you sort of broke out uh, it's called uh big blue big blue it's 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 yeah it's the uh one of the brands that adreno brings in okay. so it's a really great rechargeable torch so i use the narrow beam because that pierces like these dark caves much better um and then yeah. I use the the rob allen super tech socks yeah okay um yeah, just uh, but you know, sucks again is something that you yeah. kind of like. I don't know, man. You like if you're rock hopping heaps, you just personally, I think brands should should have a five pack available. Um, if any brand, <laughs> if any yeah. brands are listening, like yeah. just sell sell booties in a five pack and give us a good <laughs> discount. I'm I'm in. I'm buying them. Oh man, yeah, you go through sucks heaps, man. So yeah, so, yeah shore diving is just it punishes your gear. Yeah. So and then uh, down here, obviously, like in the bay, if I'm diving in the bay, I only really. Uh, I use a 10 meter float line unless I'm going for scallop diving, which I might use a deeper float line then. And if I dive the back beaches, um, I might use, uh, you know, two float lines just linked together because I don't like have, I've got like a 10 meter float line and then I've got a 20 meter float line. Uh, well, I've actually, I've, I've trimmed that down to like, I think 16 or 17. So I like, I link them together. So I've got a little bit more length uh, when I'm diving the back beaches. Um, and then obviously a nice big float. I've actually, um, uh, last year bought a, a Harrison float from New Zealand. Okay. Um, so I'll tell you an interesting story why I bought this float. So when I moved here in, in South Africa, you get like these thick kelp forests, kind of like California. Yep. Um, but the, the forest is so thick, that there's no way you're swimming around there with a float. Like it's just, honestly, you'd spend the whole dive, just like tug of war with, 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 with the kelp. Um, and so we'd use, you know, those waste crayfish bags, that you can yep, tie yep. around your waist. Yeah. So you use one of them, and obviously your craze and fish go in there. So when I moved here, I was like, oh yeah, I'll just kind of do the same thing. So I went diving at Phillip Island uh, in this little bay, and you know I was having a great day. I got a cray and an ab. I was like, you know, it was it was really all coming together. I was getting some good fish, and I'd seen this cow shark or uh, seven gill shark. Uh, you know, cruising in the, in the distance, um, you know, three or four times. But, uh, you know, sometimes you can see in a, 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 a shark's behavior that, you know, you got to watch this, you know, you got to watch this guy. And this guy, you know, he was very casual. Like he just kind of swam in and swam out. So I didn't really think much of it. And uh, it was towards the end of my dive. I, I was literally in like three meters of water. So I wasn't like super deep. I was on my way out and I was swimming along the surface and this shark had come up behind me and just between my legs and grab this this bag around my waist and let's just say i i mean just imagine like looking down yeah. like you're being shaken crazy i look down and all i see is shark teeth i was like i nearly wet myself like it was yeah it was i uh, freaked out and so this thing had like literally and then his teeth got caught in the 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 kind of the, the netting <laughs> of that, that yeah. bag and it was like it went from bad to worse yeah. And so then the shark started to panic because he couldn't let go. And like I, I was panicking. Like I was like just I was going nuts and just like screaming through my snorkel like a, like a little girl. Uh, but he managed to somehow let go. And then he swam like literally not even that far, man. Like two meters away from me, and he turned like on a, like a fifty cent piece and just came straight at me again. And I had to like literally push him off me like four or five times. Um, yeah. And then the fourth, the fourth time. I, uh, he gave me enough space to, to really like swing my gun and then actually chase him. And then as soon as I could actually get some momentum behind me and like, get into his face, he, uh, he kind of just backed off and just swam away. Do you reckon that shark, like he's coming to have a go at you and he's got a big mouth full of essentially fish and has he come back here? Cause he, cause he, he might've thought, you know, that's, that's what you are. Well, so 
I, I kind of tell the story for two reasons. One is, uh, you know, one, don't keep your fish on you. Like, mm. that's just a, a big no-no. Uh, but two, that shark, he knew what he wanted. Like, he could have, I mean, bit my leg. I mean, like, literally, it's around my waist. I could have been castrated there quite <laughs> easily. But <laughs> uh, had, had, a, had a late circumcision. But uh, it, didn't, it didn't work out that way. Uh, thankfully, but so, so he knew quite clearly what he wanted. Now that might not always be the case, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, a shark is just, you know, testing the waters and he'll take a bite of you to see what you are and see how tasty you might be. But, um, yeah, so th that thing, it literally, he was trying to gr get this thing that was around my waist. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I kind of recommend either like a mesh bag, uh, which makes it one hard for uh, the sharks to get through or seals to get through, or even rays. We've got these massive bull rays and they can be a pain too. Mm -hmm. um, but so I, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to have a float that you can actually put your catch inside. Um, so I bought one of those Harrison, uh, Harrison floats from New Zealand. Yeah. So they, they can fill up with water, which is a bit of a pain, but um, you know, it's not the end of the world. Like, yeah, I quite enjoy using it. It's good for scallop dives too and things like that. So I've, it's a very practical uh, float that I like to use. And it works uh -huh. like an esky too. So like on my way back, I'll, I'll swing by... Uh, you know, a petrol station and, and buy some ice and can just chuck it in there. And it's like a little mini esky. I don't have to like have a separate esky for my fish. Yeah. Oh, nice. Nice. yeah. All right. Um, That's a pretty cool dive bag, Eckhart. Um, unless you've got another bit of equipment, I'd love to move on to Spiro Q&A. Uh, I've always got a bit more kit in the dive bag, but let's, <laughs> let's move on. <laughs> All right, cool. So this is a sort of a faster paced round of questions that, uh, Gets a little bit philosophical, which Turbo loves. Um, look, oh, love could you it. describe what the spearfishing experience means to you in one sentence? You know, it's it's that thing of coming home and preparing the food and inviting your friends over and having like a big meal and, uh, you know, basically just kind of celebrating. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lifestyle thing where, you know, you're sharing your catch and, um, you know, like one of the coolest experiences is obviously, you know, is being able to, uh, you know, give some of that fish to a friend of yours that for them, you know, one, if you walk into a store, you can never get it as fresh. Uh, you can never like, by the time you buy it in a store, that, that fish is like, you know, either months old, it's been in a freezer or it's, you know, it's, it's fair few days old where, you know, if you give it to a friend of yours, it's, it's as fresh as it can get. Yeah. And it's probably being called something else in a, in a, in a fish shop. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh. Sweet lip. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sweet lip is like gold banded snapper or something. All right. Number two, what is the single best piece of advice you've ever been given for spearfishing? Always keep learning, eh? Number three, who has been the most influential person or people in your spearfishing and why? Uh, I'd say it's probably in the early days when I really got started. Uh, it's two very good, very good mates of mine uh, from South Africa, um, Andrew Halliday and. Uh, well, Graham Fenwick, we uh, we basically cut our teeth together on the basically just spearfishing around Cape Town, and it's that combined passion of just the ocean and then good friends, and actually just enjoying the moment, regardless of whether you come home with you know ten fish or whether you're coming home with one fish. It's just experiencing that that moment with good friends and just uh, just having a good time. All right, during good, your cool. fifteen years or so of spearfishing. What is the single biggest lesson you've learned? Hmm, that's a bit of a toughie. Uh, biggest lesson, um, don't force it, I guess. So that applies to equalizing <laughs> with my, you yeah. know, just don't, don't force equalizing. Don't force depth. Uh, you know, if, you're, if your body's not ready for it, or if you're mentally not ready for it, like spearfishing and freediving, it's, it's something that you can't, it's not like uh, you, if you feel bad and you, you, like you can go out for a run and just force it. Uh, you know, spear fishing and freediving, you just you can't do that. Like you, you you're going to push yourself to to the closer to the edge of a black art or, or to the edge of a bad experience. Yeah, so I yeah, I just think yeah, don't don't push it. You know, love it. Last question: uh, If you could go anywhere spear fishing tomorrow, unlimited budget, you've got three days of spear fishing in front of you. Where would you go? <laughs> that question's changed. That. Yeah, that, I was going to say, uh, I didn't prepare for that one. Um, <laughs> ambush. <laughs> ambush. <laughs> yeah, ambush. Um, man, I've, I've just seen, like, look, I've, I've never really gone out and targeted big fish. Um, you know, I'm like, here yeah, it's all shore diving. It's, it's something big. Like, I'm not a, 
I'm not like a trophy hunter, mm. um, but uh, I'd love to try and, and uh, you know, my, my goal hopefully this year is to to really try and shoot a southern bluefin tuna. Um, okay. nice. And so that's, yeah, like I'm, I don't have like, I mean, it'll be amazing to travel, you know, like Ascension Islands and target like big uh, yellowfin and things like that. But I... I like the idea of, you know, setting small, like not small goals, but setting like attainable goals and reaching them. And also, again, I don't want to like just be a trophy hunter and travel somewhere and then shoot this massive fish and then like donate mm. it to random people. I, I don't want to bring the fish home. I want to bring it home and share it with friends or, you know, uh, you know, eat like, uh, you know, vacuum seal it and eat it for, for a while. You know, that's um, yep. that's what I'd like to do. So, yeah, that's, that's probably uh, an attainable three-day mission, you know, maybe right. down – portland way and and get some get a tuna all right nice i like it all right man so you're a free diving instructor in melbourne where can people come and find out a little bit more about your courses and what you're up to down there yeah obviously uh you know uh you can pop in at the adreno store in melbourne uh i'm also on facebook and instagram at uh, salt sessions free diving oh, okay um I try and stay active there and try my best to respond. Um, but yeah, that's probably the, the two biggest thing, the two or two areas, you know, it's obviously social media or, or at the Adreno store. All right, cool. If, um, if people come to your show notes page, they can find some links to your social profiles in there anyway. And, uh, so friggin', uh, excellent to catch, catch up with you today. Eckhart. um, the, the crayfishing section stands out for me. Like, um, there's, there's heaps of stuff in there for, for anyone that's going to listen to this episode, I think. Great, man. It's, uh, it's nice to add something different, a little different swing on things. Yeah, no, I appreciate yeah. it. And it's good to have someone that listens to the show and, and knows Turbo's bad jokes. So <laughs> you're already prepared in advance with good jokes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good. Uh, Mate, that was stuff. awesome. I love that. There's a couple of there's uh, two Melbourne guys in a row, um, probably at two different uh, levels of spearfishing, I would say, or experience levels. And um, yeah, you both you, you guys have both come up with sort of a different uh, aspect, I guess, between yourself and Sven, and um, yeah, it's bloody awesome. It just sounds like a, the sort of place, like you said, there's not a lot of huge trophy fish, but like you said, and we didn't even touch on it, scallop diving. Um, you said the calamari diving, and then you've got. Uh, we talked to Sven about King George Whiting. That's another top quality table fish. You've got snapper, kingfish, all of those things, and crayfish as well. So it's like it's pretty abundant in in high quality um, high quality um, seafood, which is yeah, which is probably like quite indicative of the southern climate. Like the colder water seems to um, have those. Well, for species. me, honestly, the the the, the, high, the highlight moving down here was that opportunity at, at shooting big calamari. Like my biggest mm. is like over three kilos. Oh. So like your oh. the hoods are like you know 50, 52 centimeter, fifty you know over fifty centimeter that's hoods. Awesome. Like that's it's just enormous. And when you see them, they're like UFO. It's just they're beautiful, you know. So Crazy. it's uh yeah, and obviously they taste unbelievable. So yeah, it's 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 great to to find out what's unique about the area that you live in and and, and try to hone your skills and try to you know um you know learn the seasons, learn you know when they're around and and how to get them. Oh, cool. Like what's the what what's the best catch you've had like what's the best seafood spread you've had from melbourne uh would you, would you well, like the best e- eating or yeah, yeah would you have put on have you ever put on a spread of scallops crayfish and whiting oh yeah yeah uh, so look i um when i go for scallops you're allowed like 100 per person which just sounds crazy yeah. but and it takes you forever to clean them so if i go i try and get as close to my limit as possible and then i will actually uh vacuum seal portions of like let's say 20 in a in a packet so uh, and they actually when you vacuum seal them they actually vacuum seal really well so when they come out Mm. they're they're just beautiful um so obviously uh we've we did a meal with uh, a friend of mine that that came out from south africa we did uh like a, a scallop pasta um and then some crayfish um, and then I think I had some kingfish or snapper. Uh, in fact, I think we even did both. Um, so my favorite thing for like a, a, a game fish, uh, or a kingfish is um, you marinate it in lemon juice and soy sauce for like an hour. 
Okay. Um, and then, um, you know, just bake that. I uh, put it on some baking paper, bake it for like, you know, 12 to 15 minutes, like just before you can start separating it so that it, when you take it out, the, the heat in it will cook it the rest of the way. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and then for your, like your softer fish, like uh, using a, like a sour cream and dill mix with maybe some lime zest and you put that over the fish and it kind of traps that moisture in. And the same principle, you want to just undercook it so that but the the res, the residual heat that's in the fish will actually cook it the rest of the way. Oh, nice! So yeah, like that, that, that was that was a big feast that 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 night. That yeah. was great. You sound like you're going to be a a regular um, columnist on the Noob Spiro writing fish recipes. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> now that yeah, you're... look, I'll, uh, as as much as I love uh, the spear fishing, uh, you know, the big passion for me is just is the is eating and preparing and and getting your like getting your catch from from the ocean onto your plate yeah, and into the and into the tummy i guess good love it all right Eckhart, we've had a we've had a ball we've had a ball buddy um we're, we're gonna we're gonna have to catch up again perfect man uh, just one other uh, quick maybe just a, a uh, uh i mean i guess a call to action that i'd like to sure. throw out there I'm I'm heading to South Africa in July, and um, there is a organisation called Waves for Change. Um, and so it's obviously not spearfishing wetsuits, but these guys work with underprivileged communities um, in in Cape Town, and they take um, uh, kids out surfing and get them into like instead of sitting at home and basically getting into kind of gang life and you know a, a troubled upbringing, they're trying to get them into the ocean and get them active and, and busy. So oh, yeah. uh, maybe just a, a call to action is you know these guys need just wetsuits. They need uh, kids wetsuits they need adult wetsuits so if anybody has any um uh you know old wetsuits lying around kids wetsuits uh uh specifically and adults too mm -hmm. um if they can maybe uh, you know contact me either via social media or at the melbourne store uh, i'm okay. i'm planning on you know try to get you know 20 or 30 kilos of wetsuits to take back and and basically oh, just a Don just don donate it to them so that they can kind of carry on what they're doing. That's awesome. We'll um, we'll do a bit of a social media blast for that as well. So guys can come and find you in the Adreno Melbourne store and give you some, some old wetsuits and they'll be put to good use over in South Africa. That's it. Awesome. That's it. Wicked. Oh, that's cool, man. Oh, good. Well, like, like, like I said, we've had a blast chat with you today, Eckhart, and learned a ton. So awesome catching up with you, man. Thanks for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Eckhart. Guys, in today's episode, we have talked about lots of different spearfishing equipment. Chances are you can get your hands on most of it at spearfishing.com.au. They've got competitive prices and an awesome hassle-free returns policy. They uh, have $15 flat rate shipping Australia-wide. Chances are, if you order that equipment today, it will be at your doorstep tomorrow. And you can even save a little bit more money by using the code NoobSpiro at checkout. That'll save you a further $20 on every purchase over $200. It also helps support the NoobSpiro podcast. So head over to spearfishing.com.au and save some money on some gear. Thanks for listening, guys. Whew, what a treasure trove of knowledge. That was a bloody long interview with Eckhart, but thanks for sticking with us to the end. Now, if you took notes, I would love to hear about it because there was a ton of information and value bombs dropped in this show. But uh, as Eckhart says, join him on social media. You can even pop into the Adreno store down there in Melbourne. And uh, if you're interested in doing a free diving course in that area, then he sounds like an absolute great resource to have um, around you. And um, it's a it's a it's a good way to start your journey if you um, get in with a guy like that when you when you're just starting off. All right, um, so thanks Eckhart for joining us and uh, and, a, and, a, and an absolute. Um like I said, treasure trove of information, particularly about the crayfish. Love that section. Um, back on noobspiro.com, I've recently written a guide to dry training for spearfishing. And uh, you can check that out. Uh, just pump into Google dry training for spearfishing, Noob Spiro. Go and check that out. If you're wanting to improve your breath hold or, you know, if you if you you're getting stuck on dry land a bit, but you just want to preserve some freediving fitness. This guide's got heaps of information to just help you do that. So check it out. It's free up on newspiro.com. It's a, it's a long one, uh, but there's plenty of information in there and resources. And uh, if there's something missing, just let me know in the comments. That'd be great to hear. Um, in a week's time, we're off to 
chat with someone else. Uh, we haven't got anything locked in just yet because uh, we're still catching up with Kickstarter people. And on that note, Kickstarter is the book is moving along well. We are in the final stages with the formatter, just going back and forth on a couple of minor details, just getting it absolutely perfect before we send it off to the printer and get a trial copy sent to us and then. Uh, and then we'll go through that process before we ship out those rewards to everyone. So thanks to those that have got on board the Kickstarter. If you still want to pick yourself up a coffee, you can, a copy, you can head over to Indiegogo, pump in uh, spearfishing, and our project will come up there. You can get on late because we uh, we had that by popular request. All right, guys, thanks for listening today. Shrek over and out. Shrek, 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 you there, mate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exciting news. I just want to let you know that Spearing Magazine has its eight-issue back catalogue for $30 US plus shipping. That's $3.75 an issue. How does that make you feel? Oh, that makes me feel oh, that's excellent. All right, guys, so if you want to get that, um, if you want to get those eight back issues, all you have to do is email jeremy at Spearing Magazine. That's J-E-R-O-M-Y at Spearing Magazine. And just say, Psst, I'm after that eight issue back catalogue for thirty US dollars. Jeremy at Spearing Magazine dot com. Oorah.